Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. Dennis Crowder here with Kasper Ozalowski on the eve of a pretty exciting, shock-filled UFC on Fox 18. Cass, what a what a crazy bunch of fights this weekend. What a crazy bunch of silly fights. There's, there's a lot to talk about. We're going to be breaking down UFC on Fox 18. We're also going to be talking a little bit about UFC on Fox 19 and how that's shaping up. And of course, the main thing, the uh, the main courses, so to speak, we've got some sexy guests on the show. Uh, Tim Kennedy, Don Fry, and Dr. Anne Maria DeMars, more commonly known as Ronda Rousey's mum. Uh, Ronda Rousey's mum, and uh, Anne Maria DeMars, she's going to be first on the show. There's quite a lot to talk to her about. Out, considering she hasn't really done a stack of interviews or almost none I think with uh, she did one with ESPN but other than that not many interviews from her since Ronda Rousey lost so there's quite a few things to talk about with her uh, Tim Kennedy is going to be afterwards we're going to be chatting to Tim I mean the guy's always in limbo you don't you know I feel like there's a few fights that he could have gotten he didn't get them we want to know is he coming back is he fighting you know Yoel Romero his old nemesis uh, there's a lot to talk about there Vitor Belfort as always and then Don Fry. Don Fry is always a bunch of fun to get his take on all the latest happenings of uh, of basically the MMA world, and he's going to be last, and then we're breaking down UFC on Fox 18. So yes, Dennis, it is a stacked show. Yeah, that's right. And even on this episode, even all, everything that's happening, me and Cass are going to break down a couple of movies. I'll be breaking down Spotlight, giving you the review. Cass will be reviewing The Hateful Eight. But speaking of reviews, Cass, a few reviews coming through on our iTunes page. Yeah, we really appreciate that, guys. Not just iTunes, but everything. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn. Um, don't forget we are on SoundCloud but we just want to give you guys a big thank you to rating us especially on iTunes that's kind of the main one we've gotten a bunch of reviews from uh, all over the place obviously you know our home country of Australia but the internationals that's the ones that get us not to say they're worth more but we really appreciate the fact that people are listening to us all around the world there's some obviously from America there's some from France there's some from the UK I saw some from Ireland as well there's a couple of German reviews so Really, really appreciate those guys. Uh, they've all been five stars so far. No pressure. Rate us whatever you think we're worth. But if you do have a couple of seconds, feel free to jump on and uh, and review us. But just wanted to say a big thank you to to all those. If you want to communicate with us, the lines are open all the time. Jump on uh, Twitter at submission AUS. We love to post a bunch of gifts and uh, funny stuff there. Uh, obviously, our Facebook, facebook.com forward slash submission radio AUS. Jump on there. Completely different content to the Twitter. And uh, in the YouTube comments, man, comment below. Drop down your thoughts. Tell us what you think about uh, pretty much anything that we talk about. If you agree, disagree, let us know. It's an open book. Yeah, that's right. And also later on in the show, me and Cass will be talking about UFC on Fox 19, giving you our thoughts on this Lyoto Machida, Dan Henderson rematch. What Mm. we think about that, we've got quite a bit to say. And uh, also the technique of the week, which comes out every Wednesday here in Australia. It's the heel hook, but heel hook by Anthony Parosh. And congratulations, by the way, to Anthony Parosh on a stellar MMA career. He just retired from MMA from the UFC, uh, top of the top, and he's had a lot of great moments in there. Congratulations to our friend Anthony. And, you know, all the best in his coaching future. I'm sure we'll see a lot of great guys come out of his gym. But Cass, we have our first guest on the line, and you're going to be introducing him. All right, guys. Our next guest is the CEO of Seven Generation Games and the 1984 Judo World Champion. She's also the mother of one of the biggest stars in sports, Ronda Rousey. It's a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Anne Maria DeMars to Submission Radio. Anne, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. Now, and welcome back to the program. As we mentioned in the intro, Seven Generation Games, for those that don't know, is a startup which creates learning games for children. We've had a look at the Twitter, and it seems like there's been a lot of exciting developments in the company in 2016 already. Can you tell us a little bit about how it's all going? It's going terrific. One of the things that's really uh, a big leap forward is adventure games. Like you play something like World of Warcraft or mm. Super Mario Brothers, those types of things have had to be played on like a console or download onto your computer, which for school doesn't work very well for a lot, a lot of reasons. So we've been able to create adventure games that now you can get a, a username and password, click and play the whole thing on the web. And it's really, really, really cool. We've now got it come out with our first game that's bilingual. So if you have kids 
I don't think it's as big of a deal in Australia as it is out here, but if you have kids that English is their second language, they can flip between Spanish and English, or they can just play the game in English, or they can use the game to learn Spanish. So, and it teaches math. So it's, it's, and it's a really cool adventure game where, like, the latest one we have, you are thrown back in time and you have to work your way back to the time and place that you came from and go through all these adventures and, and use math along the way and not get killed by the natives. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. What's, what's the feedback like? Because obviously when you hear educational games, you know, some people might think like, ah, I don't really want to play an educational game. But on the other hand, you guys make it sort of all about adventures and fun. You guys, the aim is not for it not to feel like an educational game. Is that is that the kind of feedback that you guys get, that people don't really see it that way and they just enjoy it more for the game itself? Yeah. Oh, that's exactly it. Kids ask their teachers if they can play it. And the, you know, some of the interviews we've done, we've, on the TV out here they've done with kids are really cute because you would think we set them up to it, but they don't. And they will say things like, I'm going to go home and ask my dad to play this to get this game so I can play it after my homework's done and I can play it every day. Mm. So a lot of kids like to play it outside of school when they're done their homework. And it's One of those things, like Maria said, there comes an age where kids say to you, I'm not going to do my homework and you can't make me. And the truth is, after a certain point, you can't make them. You know, you have middle school kids who they're just not going to do it. You can take away their, you know, their phone. You can make them sit in the room. But if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. So we tried to make these games that were fun enough that kids wanted to play them. They wanted to get ahead. And the only way you can get to the next level is if you solve the math problem, like for building pyramids, like the Mayan, in, the Mayan Indians in Central America, South America built pyramids. Mm. So you're building pyramids, and the king is kind of looking at you because your pyramids aren't getting built as fast as the next person. And the reason is because they were smart, and they had all the workers lift rocks and figured out what's the median, what's the average that a person can lift, and then they got all the stronger workers to, to work on their pyramids. If you can figure that out, Yours will get built way faster than the others, and you won't get killed by the king from your father. And so it's that kind of stuff. And then if you get it right, not only do you not die, but then you get to go in this 3D part of the world where you pick up these giant blocks and put them together and make pyramids. So, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, well, it looks like being the CEO of Seven Generation Games is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. Just wondering, how do you manage to do it and still run your judo seminars and work on all of your other projects? I do very few judo seminars. I teach at at an inner city school one day a week. Actually, my daughter Rhonda started that program six years ago when her older sister was a history teacher there. And so the program has been going on for a long time. I teach one day a week and my friend teaches the second day. And that's usually the only time I can carve out. So I do a few seminars with those kids. So if there's a camp, if there's something going on that I can bring 15 or 20 of the kids to, then I will go. But other than that, it's really hard. And it's funny because, you know, the other people who win world championships in judo go and they found a company that sells mats or they started a judo school. And I decided I'll get a PhD and specialize in applied statistics and write software that teaches kids math. So mm-hmm. I kind of break the mold in a lot of ways. <laughs> You went in a completely separate uh, <clears throat> separate direction. You mentioned Rhonda before. It's funny because when we were organizing this interview, you wrote to us, said that, you know, being Ronda Rousey's mom wasn't your actual job and that you're busy with seven generation games. With Rhonda's popularity, have you found that being Ronda Rousey's mom has almost been a full-time job from all the interviews and fans constantly approaching you? No, because I turned down almost all of them. I think you asked me four or five times before I could manage to do it. And, like, right now I'm driving around town trying to find the stuff for her and <laughs> Mm. So, no, I mostly just say no um, because I just don't have the time. Yeah, well, there it is. All the listeners know the horrible, horrible truth behind how many times we ask you to do an interview. But speaking you know, speaking of Seven Generation Games, one of its investors, Ronda Rousey, hosted Saturday Night Live. For those wondering if it's a, even a big deal, it is. It's a big deal here in Australia. Saturday Night Live is a huge program. Just wondering, what did you think of her performance and where and who did you watch the show with? I 
I thought it was great. And I watched it with my husband drinking wine randomly for Christmas bond. I got us a wine of the month club subscription. So every two months, every month we get two, two bottles of really good red wine. So yes, I watched it on a couch with my husband drinking red, red wine from our Christmas present. And it was great. And I especially like the gym scene. I thought it was hilarious. And also, I always wondered that, you know, when you watch those shows where there's the mean girl, we do all the stuff. I think, why don't you punch you in the face? I would. So I think for half the women in America that grew up, you know, watching those shows and people like that in their school, we were just all sitting on our couches going, yes, that was great. Yeah, not just women. The, the the one where Ronda Rousey was getting bullied by the popular chicks. I like how that played out yeah. where, yeah, she just that punched her in cool. the face. Because I think that's what a lot of people wanted to do. And uh, it was good to see her do that. Exactly. It, it was great to see Ronda back in the spotlight, especially because we haven't obviously seen much of her recently. And now news has come out that Ronda and Tina Fey would be starring the head role of the movie Do Nothing Bitches, which, of course, is a now famous saying that Ronda came up with. How exciting is it for you to see Ronda's success in Hollywood outside of fighting? I think it's really great. And, you know, one of the things about Ronda is... She's not just an athlete. She's very smart. Uh, she went to a magnet school here for kids in, who, were inter, who were accelerated in science. She was outstanding in math and science when she was a kid. She, we, we always thought she'd go get a PhD in like marine biology or something, you know, which shows you how well we predicted. But she's super hardworking. So I think with a lot of people, they're very talented in fighting, but they don't have a lot of skills outside of that. And... You know, fighting is not a thing that has a long, uh, you know, very wide window. You don't see, you know, people in their 50s that are fighting. And and often with athletes, my oldest daughter, Maria, the one that wrote the book with Ronda, Maria worked for Sports Illustrated and ESPN, and she told Ronda all the time when she was younger, you don't know how many people I covered their contract when they were out of high school or college, and I covered their bankruptcy five years later. You know, you need to watch it. And... I think Ron is very, very smart to be hedging her bets. Mm. Well, we we spoke to Jean LaBelle, who really encouraged Ronda to transition over to acting from fighting sooner than later. As her mom, where do you stand? Obviously, there's a competitive nature there that Ronda loves, but at the same time, acting doesn't really result in you being hurt and not being able to eat an apple, for example. Would you prefer for her to move away from MMA? I think when you, and I, I say this from somebody who has actually had experiences, you leave a sport when you're ready. It doesn't matter what anybody else wants, what your mom wants, what the fans want, what your coach wants. You'll know when you're ready. And I think many people in every sport are not honest enough with themselves to look in their heart and say, I'm done. I mean, I could tell you after the world championships, it was everything I would have taken my heart out and eaten it in front of the referee. Well, maybe not mine, but my opponents. <laughs> um, if that's what it took to win. And I'm not kidding you, but... When I was done, I was done. And I knew after that I didn't have the same thing. And I think anybody at any time, you when you don't feel that, when you don't wake up every morning, the first thing through your mind when your eyes open is how can I beat this person? How can I be better than everybody else? When that quits happening, then you do something else. And, you know, I quit. I was never sorry. So I think whenever Rhonda has that feeling, she should hang it up and do something else. Well, let me ask you, and I, I don't know, obviously, how often you speak to her, whether it's a daily thing or it's, a, you know, you guys talk every sort of week or month or whatever, but based on the conversations that you've had with her, wh- what do you think? Where do you think Rhonda stands in that respect? We haven't talked about it too much because I told her flat out that I think that that guy she was training with was an idiot and a fraud and he's being investigated for bankruptcy fraud out here, for tax evasion, for mortgage fraud. Um, they just suspended his license for falsifying the application. He was convicted of two counts of identity theft. And so, you know, we don't talk about that much because I told her flat out, you know, as long as you're training with this guy, I just cannot, cannot stomach that. Mm, mm. Well, you know, speaking of Edmund. So I don't know what she will choose to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, speaking of Edmund, let's just quickly touch on her last fight. It was here in Melbourne, actually, so we were here live for it. We were covering it here live, and it was, an, it was a crazy sight seeing Holly Holm do what she did to Ronda in that fight. Obviously, a lot of media have discussed it over and over, and the strategy that Ronda had going into the fight seemed to fall in line perfectly with what Holly was looking to do. But, you know, as, as a mother, as well as obviously someone who coaches, what did you make of, of that fight? It would have been a very difficult experience watching what happened. 
I predicted in advance, Rhonda trained with an idiot. Mm. She trained with an idiot and is a fraud. I would be shocked to find out if that guy has any record at all. I mean, as far as I know, I saw him fight once, and he fought somebody who had a record of like 6 and 20 and won on a split decision. Or maybe it was a unanimous. Anyway, he won on a decision, somebody who had a drastically losing record. Um, the guy's a fraud, and uh, you trained. Rhonda had a lot of talent. She has a lot of talent. She came into that gym with a very strong, you know, 10-year background of training at the Olympic level, and it carried her a long way. But uh, she needs to train at judo. She needs to get away from some egomaniac fraud and, and be herself. And Rhonda, as herself, can beat anybody on the planet. So um, I'm sad about it, but, you know, somebody... You become an adult and you make decisions, and sometimes you make mistakes, and you know, hopefully, you learn from those mistakes. I'm just wondering. You mentioned before that you know, obviously, obviously how you feel about Edmund and how you. It, it almost sounds like not to say that you're distancing from yourself from Rhonda, but even I think I read uh, where you said you didn't come down to Australia because you said you loved her more than winning. I'm just trying to sort of understand that because she's training with Rhonda. Are you sort of distancing herself? from sort of her MMA career, if that makes sense? Is it kind of like, look, we're not going to be talking about MMA, you and me. It's more just sort of like mother and daughter now. Right. I love I love all of my children more than life itself. You know, their father passed away, and I was the only thing they had in the world, and they were all I had. And, you know, sometimes people talk about, oh, you were too hard on this. You know, my husband died slowly and painfully over five years, and I supported all of us. And then he died, and I supported all this. And I did the best I could with three kids and a sick husband and medical bills. And um, I did the best I could. And I love them dearly. But sometimes people are willing to overlook what they know is the wrong thing because, oh, somebody's winning or somebody's making money. And, you know, all those medals and all the money can't buy you new children. Mm -hmm. So if I think she's doing the wrong thing... You know, if you're with bad people, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. You're with bad people. Mine is a good person. You know, like I was telling you, you know, this chapel we're going to and my grandson's being baptized, she paid to have that chapel built because the church needed it and they didn't have the money. Um, she's a good person and she deserves to be with good people. And mm. so, you know, we, we have our differences on that. But as far as other things, you know, coming to Christmas dinner and being with the whole family or, you know, those kinds of things, of course, never change. And Maria, you know, her sister said it the best. We loved her 20 minutes after the fight just as much as 20 minutes before. Mm. Yeah, of course. No, those, those are some beautiful words. And, you know, lastly on the whole Edmund thing, and not talking about Edmund as a person, but on the fight, the well, moment that stands out somebody that's most... good. I have a great idea. Let, let me change this and say, why don't you, cause, and I mean this very seriously because I don't know, why don't you suggest who would be good people for her to train with? Instead of, it's not like over here we have this idiot running for President Donald Trump and everybody talks about him, which is kind of keeps you in the news. Why don't we talk about people for a really good, and I'm serious about this because I don't know. I mean, I know a lot about judo. Who would you say would be a great coach for her? You know, there, there are some great coaches out there. There's obviously the Jackson Winkle John camp that Holly Holmes a part of. There's AKA, which is a fantastic camp. John Crouch runs a fantastic camp. If we're going internationally, even a John Kavanaugh over there in Ireland does a fantastic job. You know, there's a few, there's a lot of great camps, and um, I, I guess the big the biggest reason why people are looking for Ronda to move camps is because there was one point during that fight where she went in the corner in between rounds in Melbourne and Edmund gave her some advice that the fans weren't really happy with where he told her she was doing a good job and didn't really give her much critical feedback that she needed when she went out for that next round against Holly. I mean, you would have watched that fight. What did you think about the way he sort of handled the situation and giving that critical advice to her in between the rounds? Because I think that's the point where a lot of fans felt like it was time for her to switch camps. Uh, I'm known as an idiot for a long time. Now, Edmund is a fraud. And I'm like, see, here's the thing. And, and I say this, you know, I'm not Nick Diaz's mom, who from what I've heard is a wonderful, wonderful, kind woman, because I know Ron has gone out and hung out with them. Mm -hmm. um, or Chris Steedman's mom, who also I've met as a lovely person. But the difference between me and his other fighters' moms is I actually was a world champion. Mm -hmm. I actually really, I didn't just make it up and put it on my web website. I actually really did compete for 14 years. So when somebody's saying something 
talking about coaching, I know if it's bullshit or not. And this guy is a complete fraud. So it did not surprise me from for a second. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I teach statistics and I um, write software. And every now and then I will meet somebody or interview somebody who claims to be an expert in software development. And fairly quickly, I know if they are or they aren't. And they could maybe, you know, pull the wall over somebody's eyes who wasn't as experienced or knowledgeable. And I don't claim to know everything, but I know what it takes to win a world championship. I know what good coaching is. I know what training to beat the world looks like. Mm. In and the- I told Rhonda more than once about Edmund. I know what tra- training to beat the world looks like, and this isn't it. In the past, and you've spoken about how uh, you injured your knee, you lost in judo, all while in the middle of a divorce, and, and this is a very tough period for you, but you went on to win the judo championship six weeks later. This sort of aligns with the theory about all greats being fueled by a loss. Do you think that this loss could be a catalyst for Ronda to improve even more, and that we po- we may possibly you know see the best version of her yet to come? I mean, if she changes gyms, she could go dramatically further. And actually, I used to be an industrial engineer, which this sounds like it's irrelevant, but it's not. <laughs> you've, done, you've done a lot of things. A, <laughs> smarter than I look. I always tell the kids I went down my gravestone. Yeah. Um, so in industrial engineering, there's a thing called the learning curve. Mm. So basically, the first time you do something, it takes you a long time. And the second time, whether it's a podcast or building a part for a missile or whatever it is, it takes you less time. Because you've learned some stuff. You've learned that, oh, you should, you know, test the microphone in advance. You've learned that you should get all the parts that you need at one station or whatever. So the second time, it takes you much less time. The third time, it takes you less, but there's not as much big improvement and so on. So the same is true, what I have found, in sports. So if somebody trains with a coach for a long time, that coach can be the greatest coach in the world. But when they switch, they're going to improve because they've learned 80, 90 percent of what that coach has to teach them. And they go to a new coach, they might not even know as much, but they won't know the exact same things. So, this, you know, even if she was with a good coach, which she mm-hmm. is not, but even if she was, I think going to a different place would really improve her. And one of the things when Rhonda was young, and maybe this was a mistake on my part, I took her to a lot of places and I didn't care who got the credit. You know, it's amazing what you'd accomplish if people didn't want the credit, right? So, other people can take the credit, I can take her everywhere, I can teach her arm bars. But other people will help her out and teach her other stuff as long as they didn't say, I tried to ride around the blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, So I didn't care. You know, she's my kid. I wanted to do well. Well, maybe that was mis- the correct thing about that is she learned a lot from a lot of people, and that's the way to do it. You know, anytime there's someone who wants to keep you from training other places, that's a bad coach. That's a person that doesn't have your best interest at heart because they can't teach you other things. Now, I think where it might have been a, a mistake is now I think maybe she doesn't listen to me as much because all those years people said, oh, yeah, I taught her this, I taught her this, and oh, your mom doesn't know anything. And I thought, well, I don't care if anybody thinks I know anything as long as it's helping her and she's getting better. But, you know, but I do know that what's correct is that the people I've seen over the years who did well, ex- extraordinarily well, are the people that trained at many places because they had the opportunity to learn from many people. And nobody knows everything. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, like Rhonda, she trained at home for five years with me and with um, Gokar Javichan at High Stand and with Tony Mojica at Mojica. And then she, um, you know, was at Pedro in Massachusetts for a few years. She was in Montreal for a while. Um, she went to different training camps around the world. So, yes, yeah, and I think that's true for anyone. Um, if I look at people, because I am a statistician, right? So I'm always interested in looking at data. Mm-hmm. And I look at people I knew in the U.S., that had a great deal of talent when we were young and the ones who, who like, won Olympic medals, world championships, and those who didn't. And one thing they all had in common is they all moved at some point. Mike Swain, who, um, you know, was the first American male to win the world, he grew up in, on the East Coast. He worked with Yanni Nesca, who's an, an amazing coach out of Cranford, New Jersey, who at one point was the Olympic coach. And then he moved across the country to San Jose State and went to school there for four years and went to Japan and so that's a commonality that you see in most people who are phenomenally successful. They don't stay in one place. They stay there for a while. They, you know, they improve and then they leave. And anytime someone doesn't want you to leave and discourages you from leaving and tries to prevent you from working with other people, they're all about them. They're not, they do not have your best interest at 
Mm, mm, no, some great points, mate. And I guess what fans are wondering is, you know, with Ronda taking time out and being away from fighting for the majority of 2016, do you think that this rematch with Holly Holm will eventually happen? And how do you see this rematch going compared to this first fight? And I mean, it does seem like Ronda will be with Edmund for her next fight in the UFC, which looks like to be well, this rematch. Do you think it's correct. still possible to, to I mean, beat I Holly? I hope that he loses his license or goes to jail because either of those are a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think if she changes, she has, if she changes and translates, she's an outstanding chance Um If she doesn't, you know what? As a statistician, one of the things we tell people all the time is the best predictor of past behavior is of future behavior is past behavior. Mm-hmm. If you do the same things with the same people, you can expect the same results. This is why people don't like me because I say that I, I say what I, I call the facts as I see them and not as how they would like them to be. No, we, we certainly appreciate your honesty. And now, before we let you go, obviously switching topics, we have to ask for for ed, you know for educators or schools in Australia or New Zealand who want to try seven generation games. What is the best way for them to get the process going? Because we know you guys have any success in the states, but if you're down here, Australia, New Zealand, how how can we get around it? They oh no, they can go to www seven that's mm-hmm. number seven mm-hmm. seven generation games dot com. And you can, you know, any individual, you click on there, there's a buy button. You can buy the game and download it and play it and get it anywhere in the world. And then if they're a school and they would like a school license, they just need to email us and we can set them up so they can use it in their school. And so now with two of the games, they're played completely online so you can play them anywhere in the world. And then with the other two, they will be that way within a year or so. But right now, yeah, you just mail your flash drive and we can send you a link to download them and you download them and install them on your computer. Mm. Well, there you go, Australia. Get yes, behind. We're, we're se- up for worldwide domination. That's it. Yeah. Get behind seven generation games. They're seriously changing the way kids learn all around the world. And as Anne Marie said, number seven generation games.com is the place to go to check out the games. Make sure you do. You won't regret it. And also, for a way to get some really important life advice, she writes a lot of great articles that you can check out on her Twitter. And that's at Dr. Anne Maria. Thank you so much for your time. We know how busy you are, and I know we asked you a few times, but very lucky to have you on and have a moment of your time. Thank you very much, Anne. All right. You're welcome. I got to go. <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben, and you're listening to Submission Radio. They're fucking rad. All right, guys. Our next guest is one of the deadliest men in MMA. He's UFC middleweight, a green beret, and now he's added movie star to his resume as he stars in the movie Range 15. Tim Kennedy, welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you today? Dude, I'm great. Uh, the intro is partially accurate, as you said, that I'm the most deadly man in MMA. I don't think you should limit it to a single sport. Right. <laughs> that there's 7 billion people on the planet, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find one that is better at killing people than me. You would say you're number one. Out of 7 billion, you are number one, correct? I, I think there's there's about 10 or 15 dudes that it would be a pretty competitive um Thing to see which of us, and I know them. You know, they're in the same field as me, obviously. So, you talk, you're talking to two of them right now. We're like number nine and ten, clearly. <laughs> uh, I, like, I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah, we so, run. How you guys doing? Yeah, good, good. We run into each other in our stone cutter type meetings discussing who we're going to take on next. But let's talk <laughs> about Range 15. The trailer for Range 15 is officially out and looks funny and tense and generally a good time. We touched on it last time on the show, but tell us about what was it like acting in the movie for the first time and being around people like William Shatner and Danny Trejo? Oh, my God. I love those guys. Um, so it was really easy because – the vast majority of the people that were part of the project were my friends, colleagues, associates, deployed with them, owned companies with them, um, you know, some guys from Ranger Regiment, some SF guys, some Medal of Honor guys. Like, it's all my really close community. So then we just throw in a couple of actors and some cameras, and then we just kind of be ourselves. Mm-hmm. So there, there was, there, there's very little uh, acting involved. Um and, you know, I just seemed like a naked maniac through this, you know, the last portion of the film, which is a very natural, um, you know, place for me to be. I can, I can really embody that character. 
<laughs> yeah, we we saw that in the trailer. A naked Tim Kennedy. We were like, huh, okay, interesting. We'll add this one to the to the must watch pile. And if if you're familiar with the guys from Ranger Up, like Matt Best and the gang, we noticed in the trailer it is very similar, similar humor. I'm just wondering though, any funny stories or experiences while on set? And does Danny Trejo really wear pink bunny slippers? Because there's a meme floating around. That's exactly what he's wearing. <laughs> uh, all right, so you know every. The, the scene, the scenes that we have to do that you're kind of the focal point, you think are terrible. The focal point, I mean, you're the you're the you're the brunt of the joke. Um, there's a scene where Matt, you know, uh, Matt Best from Article 15, he gets infected from a zombie, mm. and there is a cure. We have the cure, and we're trying to get the cure to Range 15 to save the planet, and um, the, the way that this particular cure can be administered is anally. Um, <laughs> and Matt was really not happy with this scene. Um, and we, everybody else is laughing, cracking up, dying, you know, and, and um, he's like, I don't like this. This is horrible. You know, but every one of us has that scene, you know, where like I'm naked fighting Randy Couture. Um, mm. And uh, was I thrilled about being naked? With, you know, there's like 400 people there, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with combat dick. That's where you're like doing something <laughs> very athletic. It's similar to like being cold, but it's a it's like the the consistency is, is somewhat different. Where it's like, anyways. Mm. Um, so there, you know, there's there's cameras, and I'm fighting Randy Couture naked, um, and uh, like I wasn't super thrilled about that. But on the flip side, uh, it's still com- going to be completely awesome and hilarious, and. Uh, and you could go through every single one of the characters and there's a scene. And that, those are the parts that were really funny to me was, you know, the guy that has to sit there for a second and be like, and he just has to man up. He has to ball up, balls up and say, dude, screw it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for the team. I'm going to take this one, like literally and metaphorically mm. in this particular scene. Mm. He took it for the team. Oh, wow. <laughs> see, what, see, what I did, see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hear it'll be coming to cinemas, but there's plans to release it elsewhere first. Can you tell us about that? And when can we go and watch it? Uh, so 4th of July is going to be the, the wide release. Mm-hmm. And um, that is, you know, move theaters near you type thing. Um, we're also going to do a direct to you thing. And... Um, we are in the arguing stages with a whole bunch of different distribution channels um, about, we, you know, the, the deal is we want it so important to us um, and so special and so close close that uh, we, we want to maintain a certain amount of control and some of that is lost sometimes. So we're just, you know, it's, we're, we're juggling. It's going to be a huge success. Obviously now I think it's at like five or six million views or something on, on YouTube wow. and Facebook. Uh, the trailer. So it's going to be something special. And uh, now it's just figuring out the best way to do it while we can still own it. Awesome. Well, we, we definitely can't wait for our opportunity to check it out. Uh, moving on to MMA, and we've got absolutely no segue here, but we've got to get your thoughts on, obviously, Yoel Romero being flagged for USADA for a potential drug test violation. Obviously, we saw some of your thoughts when you had a field day on Twitter, but I'm just curious, what was the first thing that went through your mind when you saw the news, and were you surprised at all, Tim? No, 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 not surprised at all. Um, first thought that came, no, the first, I, I got pissed myself laughing, mm. um, you know, because it was like, Karma's a bitch, and um, I don't think Karma's done with that guy. Uh, you know, like hypocrisy only runs so deep, and it's pretty deep with that particular athlete. Um, and uh, so, like, I just laughed and laughed for a while, and then I was like, okay, now I must troll him. <laughs> so, got online and just started trolling a little crap, though, leaving crap. It was super funny, was people. Um, started taking my, me trolling him out of context. So I had like a whole bunch of like, I'm a Christian. And there was a whole bunch of dudes coming on or like people coming online attacking me and be like, dude, you're, you're so evil. Like you mentioned Jesus and steroids. And I was like, no, no, I mentioned a Jesus uh, and steroids. <laughs> but it was, it was directed at Yoel Romero who, you know, like there is no, never mind. I can't even put it into explanation for you. Just, just forget it. Just, you're just gonna have to take my word that I'm not attacking Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is cool with me. But it was it was per, it was a a riot. 
Well, it's good that you went on record and cleared it up for all those uh, people out there who thought that. Now, your controversial fight with Yola Romero was a big catalyst for the extended hiatus from active competition. There was a lot of frustration on your end with him and the sport of MMA. Did you find any vindication in seeing him flagged by your side and being removed from the UFC's rankings? No. No. So, like, Jacques Ray <laughs> is still going to have a loss to him, even though everybody knows that he was using steroids for that fight. Mm-hmm. Right, and he 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 cheated with Derek Brunson. He cheated with me. He cheated with Jacare in the ring and out of the ring. So he still got paid to win. He's you know like no, there's no vindication. He's been a cheater. I've always said he's a cheater. There's no there's no change. Um, you know like no no no. Do you think that this has thrown like a massive wrench in the middleweight division, seeing as he was potentially next in line for the title shot? You know, for beating Jacare, he's eliminated Jacare from the runnings. Weidman just lost, and now he's out of the runnings altogether. Um, it's blasphemy that he was ever even considered in, um, like title contention. You know, like I, the, the champ of a division needs to be like the embodiment and the personification of all the best things about that division. Mm. And, uh, he, on the other hand, was the antithesis of that. He was like the worst thing ever. Um, you know, a hypocrite, a cheater, a liar, um, a scare, a PD user, user um, an eye poker, a groin kicker, a fence grabber, a stool sitter, um, a Vaseline lover, an ice bag dripping pile of duke. You know, it's like, no, no, you should not be champ. Wow. Okay. Well, let's let, let, give us your thoughts about this. I mean, a lot of people are sort of debating the fact of whether or not they think Chris Weidman deserves an immediate rematch with Luke Rockhold. Right now, with the way things look, it looks pretty likely. Do you think that makes sense? No. Um, I love Chris. He was a great mm-hmm. champion and I think he's I think he's the number two guy. Mm. Um but this the, this trend right now of the loser of a title fight coming back for an immediate title uh, mm. rematch makes mm. zero sense to me. If it's a close contested split decision, you know, it's like, what a great fight. Oh my gosh, you know. Maybe, 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 <laughs> maybe. You know? Mm. But when you get knocked out, dominated for three rounds, no. Like, you know, the, the, the Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm rematch talk, even the Cain Velasquez, Verdum stuff, yeah. no, it did not make sense to me. And uh, Chris Wyden and Luke Rockhold uh, absolutely didn't. You know, let, let Chris go knock a couple of wins off, see if he can beat a couple of strike force guys, and, um, you know, which, which I have doubts about. And then... You know, then he can um, get back in there and fight for the title. It's funny because you mentioning that, it was a big topic that we discussed last week on the show about how there is a lot of rematches in the UFC. This one, it kind of seems like it's happening due to the, I guess, situation and consequences. Not that it makes sense, but in your opinion, do you think the rematch, Rockhold and Weidman too, will it be much different? What do you think it will go? Because a lot of people said it was it was very close going up until the, the moment where Chris threw that spinning kick, Rockhold got on top of him. Do you think it will be much different in the second fight? No. I don't. I, um, it was close for like the first two rounds. And then you could see the momentum shifting. You could see um, Chris start to wane. You know, he started w- waning towards the, end, towards the end of that second round. And you saw Luke start picking it up. Um, and th- this is indicative of all of Luke's fights. And, um, you know, it's when he beat Jacques Ray, it was very similar. It was, it was close the first two rounds, mm. you know, and then you saw this momentum shift. And Chris is a monster in, in the later rounds, in the end of rounds. And um, so, no, I don't think it would be any different. Um, maybe that end might come a little bit sooner, but it's very similar. Mm. Well, looking at the matchups uh, that, that seem to be popping up, you've got Belfort versus Jacare, probably like we mentioned, Weidman versus Rockhold too. But no mention of you, though. Even though you've thrown your hat in the mix via Twitter a number of times, why is that? How do you feel about getting passed up for some of these fights? <laughs> All right. I, I'm just going to go ahead and say that Reebok is the best apparel company on the planet. They spell names correctly. They have impeccable design that they really, really grasp the culture of mixed martial arts and especially all the very unique cultures of the athletes that, that exist within it. And they have done the perfect job of marketing each of us individually and making us look the best that we can in every single fight. Mm. Now that I've said that, 
hopefully I can have a fight. Obviously, none of that is true. Um, and it's like the opposite of every single one of those things. But, um, okay, but I said it, and you can quote me on that, that those were my words, and now I'll probably get a, a fight. Um, probably if Anderson Silva beats Bisping, which I don't think he will. But if he does, that would be my dream fight, is to wreck Anderson Silva in a round. Wow. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Obviously, there's certain fights that interest you, that being one of them. There's other ones that you've shouted out before about, say, Vitor Belfort, you know, know, Dan Henderson in the past, Leto Machida. I'm just wondering, how actively have you been pursuing them? Like, have you contacted the UFC at all? Uh, Or are you sort of waiting for them to make the first move and contact you? you? Have you spoken to someone and they say, no, Tim, we're not giving this fight to you because you said things about Reebok? Or or what's, what's going on here? I think my words were that I would crawl from Texas to Las Vegas on my knees mm. if Joe Silva and Dana White gave me a fight against Anderson Silva or Vitor Belfort. Um, I was in Las Vegas last week for work, and um, I was trying to link up with Joe for a lunch. Uh, unfortunately, he was at a fight, so I missed him. Uh, but you know, I, I, it, is, it is not a question about who I want to fight or when I want to fight. Mm. Um, they had offered me Leo Machida. Uh, the end of March, and this, this, this March, just in, in a couple of months, they offered you Leonardo Machida. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, but I'm going to be deployed for the military, and this for the U.S. Army, um, and they're really hard to say no to. Like <laughs> by hard, I mean they'll put me in prison if I say no. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I couldn't fight at the end of March. I asked, you know, for a different date. Um, Leoto would be a fun fight. Anderson would be an, a really easy fight. So obviously I'd prefer to beat up, you know, a former champ, um, steroid user, mm-hmm. uh, and stylistically it's an easier match. Um, but either way, you know, as soon as I get back from this deployment, I would love to fight whoever they want. Just to, oh, okay. So just to get in, Dennis. So after, afterwards, there was no hard feelings. It wasn't like, okay, you don't want to fight Leota. We're putting you on the back burner till you're ready to fight again. It was, that was sort of fine with that. That was sort of like, okay, let us know when you're ready. And then when you're ready, we'll give you someone else. Um, I don't think they're ever okay with, um, me or anyone saying no to a fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, e- even if you have the best reason in the world, um, you know, like I have no choice. I can't. I can't say no to the military. Right, <laughs> the military yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's, I have no choice. Um, but you know, on the UFC side, they, they still have a promotion to run. They don't really care what, the, in their perspective, but an excuse is um, they just have an athlete that can't, you know, show up for a fight. Yeah. No. Well, I mean. It's one of those situations. It's crazy. And just quickly for people that uh, don't know, with your deployment, are you still active with the military? And how, how often are these deployments? When will you be coming back, for example, from this one so fans can sort of look forward to a certain time period that you might be coming back? Uh, I can give you specific dates. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm gone. I'm gone for not too long. Uh-huh. And I go to places where I'm still active, you know, I'm still, still a green beret, special mm. forces sniper. Mm. And, um, so, you know, we go to kind of very specific areas of the world right now and that's where I'm going to be. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. You'll be, you'll be gunning guys down and, and signing autographs at the same time. Uh, let me, let me ask you this, Tim, when, when the Jacare Belfort matchup was announced, you tweeted out that Vitor Belfort is ducking you. Do you genuinely feel that way? Or are we just having a bit of fun, you know, via Twitter? Dude, I have been hounding that guy for a year. Mm. I mean, I called him fat and slow. Um, like when we we're on a radio show together and like, he's like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I'm just going to move on. Um, you know, like at every opportunity at every juncture, I pretty much attack him. So, uh, no, I was really, I was really gunning for that fight. I would, I would have loved, I would have loved that fight. But um, no, I really think he doesn't want to fight me. I mean, it's a good, it's a good call, you know. But yeah, bummer. well, he he is looking at a big fight again, Jacare. If he was to be Jacare and get the next title shot, would that frustrate you, or even have, or even if he have, has gotten the next shot against Rockhold, would that have frustrated you? Just the thought of Belfort fighting for another title makes me want to crawl into a lukewarm bathtub with a bag of razor blades, a bottle of vodka, after I've ingested a bottle of aspirin. 
Um, <laughs> it started that, so nice with the lukewarm bathtub, and then it just took a turn for the worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and there we are. I'm naked. I'm a naked again, and covered in my own blood. Yeah. But um, no, that would be that would be such a travesty. Like how many times? Didn't he fail his first steroid test when he was like 19 years old? And now here we are, 15, 16, 17, 30 years later, and he's still cheating? Really? And now he's going to fight for another foul? So it's a game. That's what I've decided. Every time he fails a steroid test, he gets to fight for a title. That, that what, a, what a fun game to be in, man. What a position, right? You'd be like, all right, somebody else hand me a hypodermic needle so I can fight for another title. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit of a tough situation. We don't have all day with you, Tim, so there's a few more topics we want to cover. Uh, one of them being, obviously, Anderson Silva taking on Michael Bisping in about a month. You mentioned it before. You've faced Bisping before. You've beaten him. You've wanted to face Anderson for an eternity. You know, before we talk about your call-out, who do you think wins that fight and why? Oof. Uh, um, so I think a clean Bisping will outpace, outperform, and outkick box a clean Anderson Silva. Um, and I think because of the volume of strikes, you know, like Anderson can always catch you. you know, he always has that it factor. Um, you know, the time he knocked Randy the tours 2000. No, that was Nudo Machida with yeah. uh, Stefan Bonner, you know, like doing matrix moves. Mm. You know, he, 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 he has those tricks with that said, if you take that, that you know, flash KO out of there. I, I see Bisbing outworking him, and um, if you look at when Nick Diaz and Anderson fought, you know that was a pretty competitive fight. And I think Bisbing is a superior technical striker that hits harder than than Diaz does, um, and has way way more cage prowess, mm. um, especially in a big fight like that. So. I, I can see a unanimous decision for Bisbee in that fight. Yeah, I mean, the big question is, and a lot of people are interested to see what Anderson looks like after this whole drug test failure uh, fiasco. I'm just wondering, are you going to be looking at this fight closely? You mentioned Anderson possibly not looking the same, sort of coming back. Are you going to be looking closely to see what kind of fighter Anderson is now that he's completely clean? Yeah, you know, like, I would love, like I said, I would love to fight him. And, um, and I would love to fight a version of him off of Viagra, you know, like, um, a Brazilian all roided up on Viagra is a kind of scary thought, you know, you know, especially when you're mostly naked in a cage. (laughs) So, you know, if you take the Viagra out of it, um, he's still really not a very scary, you know, tall, skinny dude. Um, so yes, I will be watching closely, but not too closely on the chance that he's still hyped up on that Viagra. Mm. And then I will just look away. (laughs) Uh, some of these guys you've called out recently, Tim, obviously Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, Leona Machida, and Dan Henderson, none of them being the champ, but I'm just wondering, is becoming the UFC champion still a goal of yours? Or at this point, are you sort of more thinking about fun fights and fights that you know get you interested and excited for other reasons? Um, no, I still want the title. Uh, you know, I'm ranked number five right now. And... I think Biz, if, let, let's say Bisbee loses, Anderson wins. You know he's going to probably slip into that like three or four slot. Um, so Anderson coming off a win, and that would be the perfect fight for you know a title, a title eliminator for me. Mm. Um, I'm not saying the UFC would give me a title fight after you know beating you know that would be what four and one with the one loss being a super controversial loss to. A, nasty ass cheater um you know so maybe uh mm-hmm. so the anderson fight would really put me in a position for a title contendership you know i would be in the mix if not the contender which is one of the reasons that i'm lobbying so heavily for it mm. now tim since you're on a aussie mma show aussie fans would kill us if we didn't ask this question robert whitaker is an aussie who's on a streak since moving to middleweight and ranked number seven australia would be a nice holiday for you any interest in facing Rod- Robert Whitaker by any chance? That'd be a fun fight. Um, also in Australia, I love Australia, and um, I, I want to go to Australia and see some sharks. Maybe go look at some animals. You know, go by the St- Steve Irwin um, family zoo and all that. 
Mm-hmm. Wow. It's I'm pr- so distracted. So many, so many great things there. It's probably one of the better deployments that, that you can have. And Tim, we've got one more question and then uh, we'll let you go. We got to ask, do you think that when you fight out your UFC contract, and last time we spoke to you, you mentioned you couldn't tell us how many fights there were left, but wh- whenever that finishes, do you think you'll be one of those people that potentially test your worth in the free market like so many other fighters are doing now? Ooh, man, I really miss Scott Coker. Mm. Um, yeah, those, those were good days. Good days. Well, I think that I think that says a fair bit. Well, if you haven't already, check out the trailer for Range 15. It stars people like William Shatner, Danny Trejo, Brandon Sharp, and Brian Callen, Phil Davis, Stephen Thompson, Josh Thompson, Randy Couture, Brian Stan, Mike Goldberg, all the hilarious guys from Rage Are Up, and of course, a naked Tim Kennedy. Wouldn't be complete without that. And you can of course follow Tim Kennedy and his unfiltered thoughts on Twitter at Tim Kennedy MMA. As always, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you for your time, and obviously, good luck with your deployment. We hope to uh, hear from you soon. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Demetrius Johnson, the UFC flyweight champion of the world, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Our next guest is a UFC 8 tournament winner, a UFC Ultimate Ultimate 1996 tournament winner, and a pride legend. It's a pleasure to welcome back Don Fry to Submission Radio. Don, welcome back to the program. Well, ladies, what have y'all been doing there south of the border since last night? Thank you. Oh, wow. You, you, you're flipping the script. You're doing the, the question asking it to us. Well, you know, we'd love to say champagne showers and, and, you know, beautiful girls at beaches, but we've just been buried down here with, with work and, uh, and and relatives that we don't particularly like seeing. How about yourself? Are you, are you doing better over there? Yeah, I killed all my relatives. Did you? So it's, it's much easier around holiday time. Yeah, we should do that. Much yeah. more peaceful. Well, how, how did you, yeah. how did you, one thing we didn't get to say to you, obviously, because we haven't spoken to you in a few months, is obviously Happy New Year, so Happy Belated New Year. Just wondering, how did you, how did you celebrate New Year's? Any annoying relatives, or did you do something fun, something crazy? Oh, I got in a lot of trouble on New Year, so we can't discuss that one right now. The <laughs> the wife and kids are lurking around, and uh, I, was, I was a bad boy, let's put it that way. Wow. Did, wait, what did you say you got locked up? No, no, I got in a lot of trouble. Oh, a lot of trouble. You know, yeah. it would have been better if I would have got locked up. Probably would have been better and safer for my marriage, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, for MMA fans, Don, uh, New Year's Eve brought Ryzen's show featuring old school fighters such as Bob Sapp and Fedor Emelianenko. Just wondering, did you happen to watch any of the fights from Ryzen? No, I did not, partner. I did not. We um, we don't own the, we don't watch TV, so... Uh, you know, the only time I watch a fight is when um, I go over to Buddy's house or if I'm going to, you know, do one of the Predators predictions or something like that. That's that's the only time I'll, you know, get on the internet and watch it that way. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, you, you don't find it tough, you know, living without a TV? We couldn't live without a TV. No, actually, it's, it's wonderful, you know, because you get to... Uh, Listen to the wife 24 hours a day. What, what could be better? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I know I know you've got a secret TV hiding somewhere in that house, Don. Now, as you know, Saki Kabara and Jerry Millen are both behind Ryzen. It's got a big pride vibe because I know you haven't watched it, so we just want to sort of convey it. It does look a lot like pride. Do you think Ryzen could be a pride 2.0 and grow as big to the fans as pride once was? No, no, they- they don't have the money or the respect. Uh, they, I, I talked to them a few months before the uh, New Year's Eve, so they don't have any respect towards the fighters. So they don't have a chance. You said you talked to them. Who did you talk to? Was it Saki Kabar or, or Jerry Millen or someone else in there? I, I talked to Jerry Millen. Okay. And you say, what makes you say that they don't have the respect? Was it your conversation with Jerry? Yeah, yeah. That's I can't, I can't, you know. I'm from a different generation, ladies. I don't spill my beans all over, you know? Yeah, so I well... Just, I'll, talk, I'll, just, I'll just say a nasty sentence and leave it at that. <laughs> what, I'm, I'm just curious, though. What did they want from you? You guys were obviously chatting. Did they want you to be a part of the event? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Mm, it's interesting because you're not the only person that sort of has issues with Jerry. Obviously, we had uh, Bas Rutten on the program, who's not a big fan of his, and Mauro Ronaldo don't, don't like him, so it's interesting. <laughs> and we actually had Jerry Miller yeah. on the same show as Bas Rutten, so that was sort of an interesting experience. But anyway, moving on, you fought oh. many great competitors in Pride. Does a part of you wish that you got a chance to fight Fatal back in those days? Of course. You always want to. 
he always want to fight the best. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure he was his aim and goal was to fight me. Do you think that's what they were talking? I, I don't know how much you can sort of tell us, but when they, when you spoke to obviously Jerry Millen, were you possibly one of the guys that they wanted to fight Fedor for that New Year's show? No, no, they they want me to fight somebody else because they they didn't have the money to offer me, you know, um, a Fedor level fighter. Ah, okay. okay. Are, you, are you are you at liberty to tell us who they wanted you to fight? Uh, they want me to fight TK. And it wasn't up your alley. You didn't want to fight TK. Um, they were so far away on the money situation, partner. It mm. was disrespectful. The mm. whole conversation was disrespectful. It's crazy because obviously Fado's got the big money offer. I'm wondering if they did come back to you with a decent offer, would you be willing to possibly fight a, a higher level caliber fighter, possibly even Fado in the future? Well, they would have to clean the chalkboard. You know, they mm -hmm. uh, they're in debt to me um for a couple things so they would have to come and clean and clean the board with that first you know and then we could start discussions well you know while we're talking about obviously you're you're finding a f and you know before we sort of talk about the future this february it's actually going to be 20 years since you fought your first official mma fight at ufc 8 which was you know february 16th 1996 which is just a couple of weeks away when you're reminded of these crazy accomplishments you've achieved, you know, all these big anniversaries happened, do you ever sit down and look back on, on some of the, you know, amazing achievements that you've accomplished? No, I had, fought, I had been fighting for a year and a half before the UFC. Oh. You know, um, I wrestled in, yeah, I wrestled in college. I did a year and a half professional boxing. And then I got out and I worked for a living as a professional fireman on my days off. I was shoeing horses. And then I got into judo, so I took up judo for uh, about a year, year and a half. And then I called Dan Severn up, and after I saw him in uh, number five, and um, he got me some fights cross country. So I had already, I had already been fighting, you know. And anybody who tells you they were a pit fighter, or a bare knuckle fighter, or, uh, you know, a swing set fighter, or anything like that. You know, before 1993 and the UFC showed up, they're a fucking liar. Okay? <laughs> Nobody did any of this until the UFC came around here. Mm. Uh, th that's very interesting because obviously on your Wikipedia page and Sherdog as well, they don't have those fights. So how many fights did you have before the UFC? Was it So it was three fights before you actually had that first fight in UFC 8. Is that right? I think I had... Um, I think I had about four or five fights. You know, I don't even remember. But one mm. of them, one of them was uh, New Year's Eve, I think, up in Kellogg, Michigan, and it was it was a weird one. It was two out three falls. You know. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, and uh, the guy they had the guy on the poster. You know, he was the main main event. You know, because it was for the World Heavyweight Shoot Fighting Championship, and. Um, um, so they, they had him on the poster, big muscly guy, all tattooed up with sunglasses. He looked, he looked like the rock, you know, and yeah. the rock's prime, you know? And I said, shit, man, this guy's going to kill me. This guy's going to, he's out to freaking kill me, you know? And, uh, so I went out there and I, I basically killed him, man. I'm just out, just out of fear and desperation, man. I, my, my corner was like, take it easy, Don, sell now. It's still down my ass. It's still breathing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's not over until they stop breathing. So how, how does that work? Because two out of three falls is something you associate with pro wrestling matches. You know, first one to get pinned twice. Right. How, how does it work in an right. MMA fight where you got to knock the guy out twice or submit him twice? How does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's basically it, yeah. And, you know, that was like me. I was like, wait, is this a pro wrestling match? Does it work? You yeah. know, or is this, this is a suit? And... You know, and I kept asking everybody, and they were like, "No, it's a shoot, it's a shoot." I didn't like. Fuck, I don't trust any of you people. I don't know you people. I'm all the way over here in Michigan. You know, they hell they had Frank and Ken Shamrock was there. Yeah. You know, front row. Um, uh, uh, the Russian. Um, who's the Russian? I know the Russian too. Um, the guy that went into movies. Russian from you. Taktarov. No, we got. Taktarov, yeah, Taktarov was there. Um, you know, 
Dan was there. Dan was fighting also, you know. And, uh, heck, so, oh, I'm, I'm tying up the hay bale right now. So, um, you know, I had all those big names there. So I'm like, geez, I better do something right, you know. Or it'll laugh me out of here. And um, so it was, it was a pretty big event. Uh, and hell, if you ask me, you ask me the name of the organization. I couldn't tell you if you tortured me, man. <laughs> I don't remember. Good thing is we're not in any position to torture you, Don, nor would we. But I'm just wondering, so how, how exactly did you win the fight and did you actually have to beat the guy twice? Was it really two out of three falls or did you knock the guy out and, and that was over from there? Um, I, uh, No, I just submitted him twice. I think the first time was a key lock and the second time might have been a choke. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, going back to UFC 8, I mean, it was, you had to fight three men in one night to become UFC 8 champion. Do you ever look back on what No Holds Barred or MMA was like back then compared to now when guys don't often fight as often and injuries cause big fights to be canceled quite regularly these days? Yeah, I mean, we were men. We didn't, there were no holds barred. There are no freaking rules. There's nobody, no, no eye gouging, but those are more guidelines than rules, okay? And you fought three times. Now, now they have women fighting, okay? That pretty much tells you all you need to know about it, boy. You know, it went from, it went from a fight to a sport to a reality TV show. Well, the interesting and a women's, and a women's, women's lingerie match. The interesting thing is, I mean, obviously, when we're talking about injuries and, and fights being canceled, we've got to bring up, uh, you know, Cain Velasquez. UFC 196 is shaken up when Velasquez pulled out of his fight with Verdum due to a back injury. Before we discuss Verdum and, and what he did following Cain's withdrawal from the fight, we just wanted to get your thoughts on Cain. In the last two years, he's only managed to have one fight, unfortunately, due to injury. And his fight with Verdum at UFC 188, he didn't really look the same, which many blamed on the altitude. Do you think we'll ever see Velasquez ever return to his earlier form? Or do you think you know, he's a bit too injury-prone to ever become champion again? No, he's done. You know, what? you know what's wrong with his back? He has no backbone. None. You know? So, you know, if he ever, if he ever fights again, I will be completely surprised. You know, I mean, they got to lay odds in Vegas. Who, you know, who will be the first to fight again? Him or uh, that chick? Who's the chick? Ronda, Ronda Rousey? Rousey? You know, neither, neither one of them are going to fight again. Well, before we ask you about Ronda Rousey, the interesting thing that happened after Kane pulling out uh, was that uh, Stipe Mirchich was slotted in as a replacement. However, Verdum shortly pulled out of the fight himself, citing he was injured and was only willing to fight Kane with the injury. Fans have been critical, saying if Verdum could fight Kane, why can't he fight Stipe? What do you make of the situation? If you're healthy enough to fight one guy, should you be healthy enough to fight someone else, Don? Well, you know what? That, it shows you one the, the level of intelligence of the fighters. Because I'll tell you what, the only time I ever, the only time I was ever healthy was back in '96. Okay, after that, the best I was was seventy percent. I, I mean, I was as bad as five percent. But um, these guys, they have this opportunity to say no, oh, and you know, I don't know if they still get paid by their sponsors since they. You know, the Reebok deal is a sponsorship, but that's not, not my problem on my business. But, you know, uh, they had the option to say no. We we, we didn't back then. Back then, um, if you, you pulled out a pride fight, they, they could find a replacement for you forever, you know. Now, um, now they got you with a contract, you know. They they want to they wanna, they wanna use you. You know, I'll get some money out of the but we we didn't. There's no guarantees back then, you know. And everybody wants a guarantee nowadays. It's a different different world, man. Well, just talk to us about that mindset. Obviously, us not being fighters and a lot of the listeners probably aren't fighters either, but talk to us about that mindset of, let's say you go into a fight, you know you're injured, and you sort of have to make that decision, the difficult decision of, you know, do I go into this fight with injury or do I sort of pull out with this fight? You said you've, you've never, you know, you, you haven't pulled out with a fight, you had to sort of do it in pride. What was the sort of mindset behind that? Stupidity. Just plain stupidity. Oh, shit. I mean... You want to think you want to think you're so all bulletproof and you can do anything, but you know it all catches up to you eventually. But you know, hell, it 
like I said, you they could out of sight, out of mind, man. If you don't show up to fight, they could replace you, mm. and they could replace you forever. Yeah, I'm I'm interested to hear, Don. What was the worst injury you ever had in your career going into a fight, and how did that fight play out? Uh, shit, I've had so many injuries I can't remember. <laughs> um, you know, against Gilbert Ivel, I had I had uh, uh, pulled my adductor and and strained my groin. You know, I pulled my right adductor and strained my left jo- groin. And then that first takedown, it blew. My adductor just blew, you know. Mm. And uh, that's why I had that, had that wrap and that tape on my legs, you know, because they, they taped it up and then they shot me with Novocaine for me to be able to walk out there, mm. you know. God, God bless Gilbert. He came to fight, man, you know. I mean, all he had to do was just kick a move, and, you know, and I wouldn't have been able to follow him, but God bless him. He came to fight, man, so, you know. <laughs> When you look back, broken, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, sorry, sorry. sorry. You, you go, Don. You, you were saying broken elbows. You see, you know, chips floating in your elbow. Can't, can't seem to know. I had, had the back injury. You know, back injury. I fought, carried that around for five years. You know, um, yeah, uh, broke my neck, but that's did that back in pro wrestling. You know, so you can't really count that. Um, Sure. You know, just little little things here and there. When you look back on, obviously, you know, the journey that your career has taken you on, obviously you're a legend and you're known for your toughness, but obviously at a certain expense, namely your body, do you regret going through with all those fights despite having those injuries? Or, or if you went back in time, would you have done it exactly the same way? You know, I do regret it. I regret it every day. But I'm probably stupid enough I'd do it all over again. <laughs> well, let's... Smart. You know. no, don't, don't say that, Don. You, you, you're a smart guy, but this is why we want to get your opinion on the next topic. You brought her up uh, just before, Ronda Rousey. Um, we never did get an opportunity to hear your thoughts about the new bantamweight champion, Holly Holmes' knockout over Ronda Rousey. What did you think of Holly's performance, and do you think Ronda would be able to beat her if they did have a rematch? You know, I, thought, I thought Holly was amazing. Man, mm-hmm. this- just, not just because she's got a gorgeous body. God dang, you see that leg on that girl? I mean, holy smoly. Yeah, she is just, she's a train wreck. Train stopper, man. She's a traffic stopper, you know. She's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it was, they did it exactly like it was supposed to be done. I mean, Rondo's a one-trick pony, and she's stupid. She's over-emotional, you know, and... uh you know, everybody's kissing her ass and telling her how wonderful she is. And, you know, it, it you, you see it happens. Like I've said this a hundred times, you know. Everybody gets cocky and they get lazy. Happened to me, happened to Coleman, happened to Kerr, happened, you know, uh, Fatal, you know, or Fatal just got tired of getting beat up and having the mob take his money. I don't know. But, you know, everybody, you get cocky and you don't train as hard, man, and then it catches up to you. Because you know, that one person, you know, just waiting. Let me ask you this, Don, because I think the general consensus and, you know, some of the things that you've said in the past about women's MMA hasn't necessarily been, you know, the most positive. Even before you sort of made the joke about, you know, looking at women's MMA and lingerie fighting and this and that. But when you see a performance like that by Holly Holm and, you know, her obviously boxing, kickboxing acumen, does that sort of sway you a little bit? Do you sort of, you know, gain, gain a bit more respect for obviously, you know, the women in mixed martial arts? What's your take on that? I do, I do for Holly. I got all my respect in the world for me, you know. But everybody else got to—they got to earn it. They got to catch up, you know. Mm. Um, I came in. She came in as a eight-time world champion in boxing. You know, she's a real athlete. You know, mo- most of these chicks aren't real athletes. You know, mm. they've never done anything athletic, and they're not even fighters. They're just, you know, filling filling spots. You know, and. uh Jeez, uh, the game's got the game, game's got to improve for the women. It's got to. Well, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, Don. You mentioned before that you don't believe that Ronda Rousey will be making a return and fighting again. <laughs> Share your thoughts with us. Why don't you think that Rousey will be back? Because she got her ass kicked so bad, mm-hmm. you know, and, and embarrassed so bad. 
when she didn't think it was possible, you know. And, uh, you know, I mean, all that bullshit, I can, I can beat a man on any given day. I can, you know, there's no difference. You know, they don't call it women's man and weight. You know, see champion, they say this man, bullshit. It's always been a women. And I'll tell you what, I have, I've had my ass kicked. I've known lots of other guys had their ass kicked. World champions and not. And um, I've never, never seen anybody hug a pillow go through an airport. You know that? They always, they always walk with them, with them black eyes and broken nose. You know, right, 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 right in. I'm proud of it. As far as her walking through the airport with the pillow, do you think part of it was to do because? You know, she's such a big star compared to some of the other fighters that she had, you know, that much more oh extra media. Are, are you drunk? Are you drunk? <laughs> a big star. Come on, man. <laughs> she got her ass kicked. She got her ass kicked and she couldn't handle it. Man, crying. She's listening to some bozo in her corner, whatever that, that trainer is. You know, guy out of the kitchen, teaching Thai bow. And you know, it's about as effective as his boxing skills are. Holy shit. Uh, she she talked a bunch of smack and couldn't back it up, man. Holly came Holly came in there to, to whoop her ass and Holly did. Well, speaking of boxing, Don, I mean, there's been a lot of talk going on about co promotion in MMA, especially with the UFC, with big name fighters like Mayweather setting the example for guys for the future. And now there's a guy called Conor McGregor possibly being the first man to possibly work with the UFC in the future to co-promote. Do you think it's possible? Do you think Conor McGregor is a big enough name that he could force a company like the UFC to co-promote a card in the future? Sure, he is a big enough name. But, you know, the, the, uh, those boxers aren't stupid, you know? They got lucky with that uh, Tony Hall, Tony Page or whatever. You know when he fought um, oh shit, the other old guy, Randy Couture. You know mm. who who was the boxer to fight Randy? James Tony. James Tony. There you go. You know because just cause they got lucky because that guy was stupid and needed money. You know, but you're not gonna get anybody of Mayweather's caliber who who's smart enough to have money. You know, and who's gonna go in there and fight and get their ass kicked. They understand there's quite a difference between boxing and MMA. I guess the comparison with Mayweather is that he was such a big star that he was co-promoting, you know, with, with boxing companies. And now here you have Conor McGregor, who's, you know, a massive star in MMA, you know, rivaling Ronda Rousey, potentially, you know, a bigger star than her. Do you think that he's the one? And obviously, you, you know that UFC never wants to co-promote with anyone. Do you think McGregor might be the one to finally change that and they may be forced to promote with him or, or they'll, they'll, they'll do it with him? No, no. UFC's got their nets. They're in control. They're still driving this boat, man. They're not going to let anybody else, you know, grab one of the steering wheel. Mm. There's no reason to. Well, there's been a real push with fighters like Demetrius Johnson, Aljamain Sterling, asking for more money. And sort of a lot of other fighters fighting out their contract like Overeem and Matt Mitchell. Why do you think more and more fighters are coming out and being un- and being vocal about being unhappy with their pay in the UFC now than ever before? Probably because they're not getting paid for the damn, you know. And uh, the UFC took all their sponsorship money with the Reebok deal, you know. I mean, they never were getting paid for the damn, but at least they could pick it up on sponsorships. And uh, now they've got nothing. Well, a lot of the, a lot of those guys, they. You know how much it costs to run a camp? You know, to get ready for a world title fight. Probably about uh, anywhere for twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. Wow. You know, so, yeah, yeah. Because you you know you got to rent a facility, you, you got to rent a couple of houses, you know, apartments, houses. You got to rent a facility to train at. You got to rent some vehicles. You know, you got to get a cook. You got to get uh, you know, you got to get massages. You got to get a doctor, a chiropractor. Um, you know, you get your trainers. You know, then you get sparring partners. You know, you got to need sparring partners for hands and feet and, you know, for the ground. You know, this shit ain't free. Mm. 
Well, it's interesting. A lot of those guys that are testing the free market, it seems like they may end up in Bellator, and some of them are ending up in Bellator. You talked about respect with, with Ryzen and, and your conversation with Jerry Millen. It seems that Scott Coker, on the other hand, is a guy that a lot of fighters unanimously love. What's the possibility of you know seeing Don Fry in Bellator in the future? I mean, it seems like you were, you were thinking about doing a fight in Ryzen, but the respect wasn't there. What about with Bellator? They seem to be bringing back legends. Do you think we'll see you in Bellator anytime soon? No, because uh, I went to a couple of uh, Bellator fights mm-hmm. and uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, and then uh, Coker just quit returning my phone call. So the guy got no interest in me. Yeah. Finally, Don, we love watching you on the big screen. Um, for the fans listening at home who are looking forward to seeing you uh, in the next projects, what kind of movie projects do you have coming out in the near future? What can you tell us about? Oh, I can and I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, answer us this, Don. Is there any chance we'll see Predator's movie reviews in the future? Because, you know, we do Predator's predictions. We'd love to hear your thoughts on movies like Star Wars, Hateful Eight, and The Martian. Any chance of Predator's movie reviews? You know, I might do that. No, you came up with a brilliant idea. There you, you go. Know, it's a good idea. I mean, I Nobody in Hollywood likes me anyway, so I might as well go ahead and uh, dr- whoa! Might as well go ahead and drive the Huckleberry final nail on the coffin, right? You could do like a, you could have like a whole enterprise. There's Predators movie reviews, Predators predictions. You could do like Predators cooking channel, everything, all all to do with like the the Predator style. And by the way, what what's going on with Predators predictions? When's Predators predictions coming back? Oh, uh, it's on hold right now. Um. I'm back in Arizona, sit out in California. Uh, we're on hold right now. Um, uh, I got to I'm still doing a little fighting with um, a couple of health problems, and then uh, once that's taken care of, then I'll be back in California. Wow. Okay. Well, we hope that you get a lot better, Don. And looking forward to see what happens next, guys. You can follow Don on Twitter at Don Fry Fighter. And Don, as always, a real honor having you on Submission Radio. Very excited to see what 2016 holds for the Predator. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. And there you have it, Don Fry, a bona fide Submission Radio alumni. I don't think anybody would argue with that, and I think if anyone tried arguing with that, Don Fry would uh, fly over to wherever they lived and kick their ass. <laughs> a couple of health issues, but I don't think anything can uh, can hold old Don Fry down, so I don't have any worries there. Den- Dennis, any worries there? No, no worries. I mean, if anyone could do it, good old Don can. And every time he comes on the show, it's a pleasure to talk to him. I think we always get people contact- contacting us, and they always go, we love hearing Don Fry talk, and mm. I don't think there's anyone out there that can just answer a question or say I don't know, say words like Don Fry can. He's just one of those guys. He's a very, very special guy, and even though some of his opinions are a bit over the top here and there, it's it's always fun having him on the show and hearing his thought process when it comes to certain topics. I mean, uh, we've been big fans of his for a really, really long time, and having him on the show quite frequently – it's a real pleasure for us here. So another great Don Fry interview. Yeah, and he's he's very entertaining. Don Fry, the thing you got to understand about him is he's a character and he's always on. You know, he comes from that, obviously he's a fighter, but he also comes from that professional wrestling background, mm. much like Josh Barnett. You know what I mean? He, like Josh Barnett obviously had his open workout where he did some pro wrestling and he had a guy and he was suplexing him and all this kind of stuff. If you watch that and you think it's absolutely 100% serious, then you're missing the point. And I feel like it's a similar thing with Don Fry. I mean, if you haven't seen his appearance on, I believe, uh, Access TV, what's that show? Inside MMA. Inside MMA, yeah. It was him and King Mo. And at the time, King Mo was fighting heavyweight, and uh, Don Fry and King Mo were talking a lot of shit to each other. And there was a lot of insulting things that Don Fry was saying, and Mo was just laughing his ass off because it was that funny. Kind of guy you can't stay mad at. I guess similar to Chael Sonnen in a way, where if you take his mm. stuff 100% serious, it may be going over your head and you're kind of missing the point. So, And like you said, every time we have Don Fry on the show, yeah, there's there's a lot of mixed reviews, very polarizing, but there's a lot of people who say get him back on the show ASAP. We could, we'd could we have him on every week if we could and if, if he was happy to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Nah, he's, he's a great guy. And also a lot of people saying he's a fantastic guy. He hung, hung out with Team Alpha Male. Everybody loved him over there. Anytime he goes to a lot of places and hangs out with our fighters, we just hear great things about him. And fans love meeting him as well. So as always, a pleasure. Submission Radio alumni cast. Make no mistake about it, fans. Submission Radio alumni. So UFC on Fox 18 just happened. We're going to be talking about that card in just a moment. Um, But there's a few things we want to talk about first off. And 
it's it actually concerns UFC on Fox 19, which is still mm. a while away. We're talking April 16th. It'll be April 17th in Australia. Um, the fights are starting to get put together. I don't know if anything is even official. I don't know if you see on Fox 19 has officially been announced, but a lot of these fights are sort of coming out. Things are being targeted. Mm. One of the fights that came out recently, Dan Henderson versus Leota Machida. Um, if you go on our Twitter, our submission to AUS, we didn't by any means break the news. Actually, big shout out to Frank Sutton, who tweeted us that we knew at that time that the fight was, uh, that was you know, being put together, but it prompted us to put together a GIF uh, <laughs> of our reaction, which is Steve Carell from The Office looking none too enthusiastic. And it was actually a BJPen.com article that we were tagged in. And it was like the highly anticipated matchup. And I thought... Who the hell was anticipating this matchup? Sorry, rematch. The highly anticipated rematch. The first one took place at UFC uh, 157. And actually, I'm trying to figure out who even won that fight. I want to say Leota Machida by a split decision. But it, it was... I don't... Like, I, don't want, I don't want to be rude, you know, these guys are worried, but it just wasn't an exciting fight. So it's interesting to see that they've put that fight together. Dennis, mm. your initial thoughts, your initial reaction. Well, you were right. He did beat Dan Henderson by split decision, mm. but it was absolutely not the fight that a lot of people thought it could be. But I think you and me knew what this fight was going to be like because of Machida's style and Dan Henderson's style. Machida needs somebody that just keeps coming at him so he can counter-strike. Well, Dan Henderson himself just throws that sort of one punch. And a lot of times he kind of strikes himself. So this was not going to be an exciting fight by any means. And when we got through it, I think you and me had a bit of a chat and mentioned, well, well you know, two great guys, but we're happy that one's over and done with. So right. naturally, yeah, when we saw, and the word highly anticipated, I think was probably misused in this case. When we saw they were going to fight each other, especially at this stage of their career where, I don't think there's anything to gain by either man winning. Well, I mean, if Dan Henderson wins, it's great for Dan. But with Leota Machida probably winning again, I don't think it's going to do much for Leota. And also, the fight itself just doesn't look like it's going to be much more exciting than the first one. Yeah, I was pretty disappointed when I saw it, Cass. What about you? I will say, though, that both guys have certainly looked off their game. Uh, Dan mm -hmm. Henderson, I don't know if at the time he was still on a streak, but he, it was around the time where Dan Henderson was still, you know, hot. Magatu would label him hot. Leota Machida, <laughs> you know, f physically both these guys have um, declined, for lack of a better word. So it, mm. it is possible that this fight, you know, there's a high possibility of seeing a knock. Obviously, Leota Machida can knock you out. Uh, Dan Henderson still has that KO power. So we'll see if their bodies have sort of failed enough to, to the point where we see, you know, a conclusive ending. But the other reason why I bring it up is because, and, and I think this is very... Um, unanimous reaction i don't think anyone's sitting there reading this going like yes ah, this is the fight that i wanted to see i think a lot of people are kind of like really you know mm. dan, dan henderson leota machida I, I mean that respectfully but the reason why i bring it up is because tim kennedy who he spoke to earlier in the show mentioned how the ufc wanted him to fight leota machida in in march and he sort of said march tentatively so it's possible that it was march slash april being ufc on fox 19 so it looks like the UFC originally wanted Tim Kennedy versus Leota Machida. And, you know, to give a bit, of, a bit of explanation, that looks like the reason why we're getting Dan Henderson instead. So, they were the yeah. second pick. Yeah, it's one of those situations where I just want to see Dan have fights against maybe not the highest caliber guys in the division, but still guys that could put up a fight. Like, I wouldn't have minded if they put him up against maybe like a CB Dolloway or something mm. and, and on like a smaller card. Just sort of give, and this is going to sound sort of rude because, and people are going to say, oh, you're not giving the guy respect. I am giving him respect. But like you mentioned, Cass, he is on the dance wing of his career. Mm. And I just don't feel like he's getting much of a chance if he's fighting a guy like Leona Machida. And we're not going to be watching him do what we love seeing Dan do, which is, you know, throw that bomb and possibly get a knockout. And, you know, he's an exhibition fighter at this point. He's not going to be fighting for a title anytime soon. He's on his last few fights. I, I just think, you know, give him someone like a CB Dolloway. Who knows? Maybe CB Dolloway would beat him. If a guy like a CB Dolloway or, or such would beat Dan Henderson, then they can sort of use that win to get back some of the heat or steam that they lost. But with Leota Machida, it's, it, just, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't like this fight. I don't like how it's being put together. 
Dennis doesn't like it. And it, from a rankings perspective, it looks to me like they're trying to build Lyoto Machida back up. He's mm. ranked number four. Dan Henderson's ranked all the way down at number 12. And let's not forget, everybody got a bump up because of Yoel Romero being axed from the rankings. So in theory, Dan you know, was 13 and Lyoto was number five. So it looks to me like they want Lyoto Machida to get a win so he can still be relevant at that top spot. And you know, potentially, if Tim Kennedy doesn't get the Anderson Silva matchup that he's hoping for, I could definitely see him getting a, a Lyoto Machida to match up instead and Uriah Hall is another guy that might make a bit more sense for Dan Henderson mm, um, just because Uriah be is number fight. 10 that's a great matchup yeah you know possibly I mean Dan Henderson would, would go after it you, and Uriah Hall it's funny it's kind of I guess a similar matchup like Lerda Machida where he kind of you know likes to counter and he sort of goes backwards but I guess from a ranking perspective it would make a lot more sense but the UFC have clearly heard us whinging complaining and bitching and probably you know sat around in the office and, and put submission radio on on loudspeaker uh <laughs> in a big conference room and heard us talking about you know this uh tony ferguson versus michael johnson fight that no one really liked and now they seem to have you know written that wrong and tony ferguson and khabib Nurmagomedov will most likely be main eventing ufc on fox 19 if you look at khabib Nurmagomedov's twitter he's got pictures of the contract so you know it, it's a little bit more than targeted at this point i think they're waiting for you know the contracts to both be signed at each end before they announce everything is official but Tony Ferguson Khabib Nurmagomedov five round fight the main event of UFC on Fox 19 what do you think of this Dennis yeah cannot wait I mean it's a matchup that we we wanted for such a long time and now it's going to happen mm. and it's one of those fights where you sit down and you start breaking down every both guys skill set and you start going who's going to win this fight and that's when you and your buddies start having those arguments you have a few beers you have a few arguments Everybody, everybody puts in their pick, but that's what's great about this fight. Both guys at the top of their game, different skill sets, but you know, fireworks when they come together because you just don't know what's going to happen. And also, whoever wins this goes on, you know, to possibly fight for the title in the future, and that's very exciting as well. So there's a lot on the line with this fight. I'm just, I'm really excited about it. What about you, man? Well, I feel like it's going to be an exciting one. We've talked about this matchup for a while. We, we've, mm. we've, you know, flirted with the different possibilities of who to give Tony Ferguson. Yeah, but we're even, a couple of sluts. Yeah, we're flirting we're around with all these different fights. We're, we're the horse of matchmaking. <laughs> we are uh, flirting with everybody. Top 10, top 15, doesn't matter. But <laughs> Khabib Nurmagomedov, you know, we know what he does. He mm. is a fantastic wrestler. You know, he's got that combat samba background. And I think to most guys in the division, he would ragdoll them. And I'm not saying that he can't do that to Tony Ferguson, but Tony Ferguson, he puts himself in those weird positions where he'll roll for a knee bar even mm -hmm. if he ends up on the bottom for the rest of the round. And yet he still makes it a very, very exciting fight. Then there's the fact that he's, you know, he's a decent striker. He's a dangerous stri striker, Tony Ferguson. And Khabib Nurmagomedov, the biggest knock on him is basically his striking. People are saying that it's not very good. So it's a good test. And, you know, I, I don't know, or no one really knows what kind of Khabib we're going to see. I mean, he's had a massive layoff. Last time he fought, 2014, we're not talking December 2014, we're talking April 19th, the last time he fought, he beat Rafael Dos Anjos, ragdolled him over three rounds. Remember when Vadum fought Travis Brown, which feels like an eternity ago, and it should because it is, or it was, that's the last time uh, Khabib fought. So, wow. you know, if, if Khabib was coming back after, you know, back-to-back -back wins, which he is, he's coming back after 22 back-to-back -back wins, but if he fought, like, in the last six months or so, maybe this matchup wouldn't make as much sense. Maybe mm. he would deserve, you know, a clear-cut title eliminator, which this potentially might be. But, like I said, because he's coming back after a while, who knows how the ragdolling machine is going to be. We'll see how, you know, how good his wrestling is going to be. I believe it was his knees that, that were suffered, and, and I believe he had uh, surgery on them. So, I think this has the potential to be an exciting fight, and you may not see the typical Khabib show where... Um, you know, he just ragdolls his opponent. And if you do, then I guess you got to give him a title shot. Yeah, that's it. And I Which mean, is not it's, against Conor McGregor, right? Because the company wouldn't want that. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly right. But I mean, Tony Ferguson, he's one of the guys, one of my favorite guys. It's not really getting the attention that he deserves. Mm. And it's great to see him getting, you know, his comeuppance and getting a good fight, getting a big name fight, headlining a card, getting a lot more eyes on the skill set that he has. And either way this thing goes, I'm very excited for either one of these guys to possibly fight for the title. And like you mentioned, Cass, with Conor McGregor possibly winning against RDA, it's going to be a tough challenge. But if he does it, you know, Tony Ferguson, Conor McGregor fight gets me very, very excited. 
For sure. Um, and, you know, the other things on UFC on Fox 19 are looking pretty good. You got Rashad Evans versus Shogun. Mm-hmm. Very long talked about fight. I believe it was supposed to happen a few times. Injuries delayed that. You got Michael Chesa versus Daniel Berriush. Very good. Uh, Dan Hansen versus Leota Machida. Uh, Betch Cohea versus Raquel Pennington. And Hakran Diaz versus Cub Swanson. So that's what's being talked about for UFC on Fox 19. So it's shaping up to be pretty decent event but UFC on Fox 18 that's what's on our plate right now so we're going to cut it up with some nice and for- knives and forks a little bit <laughs> add some some uh, sexy barbecue sauce to it and and you know try and make it delicious what's the first fight what are we talking about first Dennis well the first one we're going to break down Cass is Ellenberger versus Safadine which was the main event of the prelims one of the first things that sort of stood out to me about that fight before both men even got in the octagon was that Safadine moved to TriStar mm. while Ellenberger moved to King's MMA now, back when you heard, to King's MMA. Back to King's MMA. Now, when you heard that, what did, what did you think about both men sort of making the switch? Well, you know, I, I definitely thought it was a good thing for Safadine just because he's looking to compete at the elite level and fighting with Team Quest. I mean, nothing against Team Quest, mm. but they are sort of looked at as more of an old school team. You've got, yeah. you know, Dan Henderson and Randy Couture and Chael Sun and Matt Linlin and, and all those guys. So I think... And for us, Sahabi, you know, look, he's looked at as one of the geniuses in this sport. He's held very highly up there with, you know, Jackson Winklejohn and um, uh, Greg Jackson and, you know, guys like that. So I think going to TriStar was definitely the right move. As far as Jake Allenberger, I mean, you know, he, he, he hasn't really had much success recently at all. He was obviously training with Glendale Fight Club. And we'd spoken to him a number of times while he was training at Glendale and he had nothing but positive things to say. Mm. Who, who knows if he if it's really anything to do with Glendale or, you know, Edmund Taverdian or anything like that. Because the thing that people have always been saying is, yeah, Ronda Rousey's been having success, but what about the other fighters? What about Travis Brown? What about Jake Allenberger? What about uh, Jessamyn Duke? What about the other fighters? Um, so... It may not be anything to do with Glendale per se. It might just be, you know what? Um, I feel like I was getting better training elsewhere, or, or I don't know. Maybe he just clicked with uh, with the coaches like Rafael Cordero a little bit better. And Kings MMA, nothing wrong with Kings MMA. Nothing wrong with a little bit of that. You've got Rafael dos Anjos and you've got uh, Fabrizio Verdum, two guys with belts. And you know, Rafael Cordero, I could be wrong, but he may have been named no. Coach Wink was named Coach of the Year last year, but Rafael Cordero is very much in the running. So, you know, I think I think good moves for both guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, great company to keep when you want to get ready for a fight. And Ellenberger did say that he had a few more, a few too many people talking into his ear, giving him advice, and that's why he decided to move to Kings. But mm. speaking of this fight, Ellenberger wasn't really able to let his striking go, which has been the case in most of his fights. It would have been, been good to see Ellenberger go for more takedowns, uses wrestling more. It's something that brought him success, and his opponents opponents don't really worry about it anymore because he chooses to strike and throw bombs instead. In the third round, I would have especially liked Ellenberger to take Safadine down, just mm. like his corner suggested. In saying that, Safadine looked very comfortable in his wrestling defense. And in a lot of ways, he showed superior grappling to Ellenberger. Safadine really, really loosened up in the third round and looked like his old self with some beautiful leg kicks across the forearms and legs. And I'm pretty excited to see Safadine back in the octagon now that he's had a chance to wear off some of that cage rust. Um, overall, it was, it was sort of a typical story of uh, Ellenberger going in there, really trying to hit it. Uh, Safadine with some bombs, not being able to do it, and then sort of not really integrating his wrestling enough into his attack, which I suppose, I don't know if it cost him the fight. I mean, he had some he had some good moments. Mm. I mean, if you look at it from the other perspective, he was the guy that landed the two most significant strikes in this fight. Mm-hmm. Um, two strikes that wobbled Safadine at the start and right at the end of the fight, if you didn't get a chance to see the final exchange, he actually wobbled Safadine with that exchange as well. It's almost like he's been on the cusp of sort of improving his skill set and showing us the potential that he has, but he just hasn't been able to do it over these last few fights. So overall, I want to see Safadine possibly fight maybe a Tiago Alves or maybe a Kevin Gaslam or a Gunnar Nelson. I think those fights could be pretty cool. Yeah, I really like the Thiago Alves matchup. Uh, Safadine's at 11, Alves is 14. Jake Ellenberg is not even ranked at this point in World mm-hmm. Tour. It's really tough. Um, if you look at Jake Ellenberg's record, he has lost, I think, five out of the last six fights. Yeah, that's right. I like Ellenberger. I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, cut the man or anything like that. I would, I would never say anything about cutting man. Some 
fighters recently got cut, like Mike Pierce and, uh, and a bunch of other guys. I know. What, Danny Castillo. Danny Castillo, um, right? Aussie Steve Kennedy only got two shots yeah. in the UFC, unfortunately, which is a shame because he's had such a long career. Yeah, but Danny Castillo was a big one. That was a real sort mm. of shame to see, yeah. Some of these weren't that surprising. Big bummer big bummer about Mike Pierce, but of course, Danny Castillo and Steve Kennedy, you know, who, mm. who would have worked all these years to get to this point. But mm-hmm. my point about cuts is I see people on the internet saying like, oh, you know, good cuts, like, you know, good stuff, good stuff. It's like, why would you be happy that these people cut? Like, we talk a lot about, you know, the business side of things and, you know, what's right for the promotion. But when it comes to being, you know, to cutting fighters, I would never celebrate that. I would never be happy that people got cut. This is, you know, people's lives. This is people that literally don't have a job now. And, uh, you know, mm. some of them, like, uh, who was it? Um, Dan Kelly. At UFC 193, he beat Steve Montgomery, who actually got cut as well. And he was saying that if he did get get cut, he was going to retire. He said he was not moving down to the lower ranks. He said he's been, you know, mm. fighting. And he, he's not even a guy who's, you know, been fighting mixed martial arts for, you know, decades. But he said he's not going down. Um, and it's a very big possibility that Steve Kennedy might do the same. You know, he got into the UFC, he's out now. So, anyway, yeah. with, Jay- with Jake Ellenberger, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope he gets at least one more shot. He's on two losses in a row. He d- hasn't hit the dreaded three. They've given him a shot after his hit three losses in a row, and I'm, I'm hoping they give him another shot. Because both him and his you know, brother, Joe Ellenberger, haven't had the greatest success in the UFC at nah, all. No, they haven't. And I think there's a lot to say for name value, and I feel like Ellenberger does have quite a bit of name value. So mm. I'm hoping that's what sort of gets him across the line and gets him at least one more shot in the UFC before they do cut him. Um, yeah, he's it's it's a real shame because in this fight, he did have, like I said, the two most significant strikes, but it just seems like he knows he has power in his hands and he searches for that power shot to knock the guy out. And he's sort of forgotten about the other aspects of the game that sort of brought him to the dance. And I'd I'd really love to see like a wrestling Jake Ellenberger, or a Jake Ellenberger that mixes in wrestling a bit more. Mm. Um, but we've been saying that for such such a long time, Cass. I mean, we've been saying that from fight to fight. So, and even against Kelvin Gastelum, it was his wrestling that got him in trouble when Kelvin Gastelum, uh, you know, took his back and choked him out, and in, in mm. what felt like seconds. I'll tell you what, I'm really happy to see Tarek Safadin back on the winning trail. He was on five wins in a row, five or six, I think five wins in a row. Uh, he was the last strike force welterweight champion, and then he got knocked out by Rory McDonald in an mm. exciting fight, October 2014, as a while ago, and now he's back on the winning track. I'm very high up on Tarek Safadin. Like you mentioned, he's got you know beautiful kickboxing, fantastic kicks, and I think he can give anyone in the division trouble, so I'm, I'm happy to see him back on track. Yeah, he'll make some great matchups, and hopefully he stays injury-free. Mm. Um, and he didn't, he didn't look that confident in this fight at the beginning, but by the end, it sort of looked like he was back to his former self. So I'm hoping to see a good Tarek Safadin in the next fight. But what about the next one, Cass? I mean, this, this fight here, Sage Northcutt, was supposed to have a different opponent. And then, obviously, uh, Brian Barbarina stepped up, and this fight was moved to welterweight. Mm. Um, not that many people worried about Sage. You know, he was still the favorite in this fight. Tell me, going into this one, were you worried at all that he was fighting above his weight class with a guy that, even though he lost his last fight, seemed, you know, pretty skilled in a lot of areas? The thing is, like, Brian fights at lightweight anyway. I think it's one of those gentleman agreements where, you know, make welterweight <laughs> because it's it's a short notice fight. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the UFC may even use that to say, well, he's undefeated at lightweight, you know, if if he wins his next fight and, and depending on, on how he goes. Um, yeah. It's always risky when there's that much spotlight on you. I mean, anyone yeah. else losing, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. But because the UFC has been, you know, pumping the Sage Northcutt train and, and shoving it down everybody's throats. And I, I, I don't want to say shoving it down everybody's throats. They're trying to make a star. And, and that's fine. But nevertheless, when you've got that much spotlight on you, it's always tough. What did you think, Dennis? Yeah, well, I thought I thought Sage was going to beat him. I mean, I think I was sort of one foot was on the train, one foot was hanging out. And I was just <laughs> flying through the stations, just trying to get the other foot on. But before I was able to get both feet on the train, I was able to watch this fight. And wow, just wow. This really showed us uh, a lot of interesting aspects of Sage's game. Your initial thoughts on the matchup, Cass? Man, good thing you didn't have both feet on there. What did you do? Did you, did you, did you do like a running roll? The, the train was going through the station. You jumped off, did a forward roll. So long, train. Well, I, I don't want to be dramatic, but I was much like um, Jean-Claude Van Damme in that ad where he uh, sort of does the splits on two, on the, <laughs> on the two, two, trucks. <laughs> two trucks. That was me basically um, at sort of the afternoon here in Australia or nighttime in America, if you care. 
Yeah. Um, I was I was more like um, Jim Carrey in Me, Myself and Irene where, when they're trying to chase the train and, and Renee Zellweger can't get on. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, well, this matchup was tailor-made for Sage Northcutt. I'll tell you what. You know you know who Sage reminds me of? He reminds me of like a Vitor Belfort. They both had a lot of success at mm. age 19. They, they were both incredibly young. Beautiful physiques, got to say that. That's actually one of the biggest marketing points of Sage Northcutt. Duh, no surprises there. But just like Vitor Belfort, Sage is very good when things are going his way. But when things are not going his way, when he when he finds you know trouble and, and difficulty, I don't want to say that he folds, but in this fight, he certainly did. And I thought for a minute there, once that arm triangle was, was you know, once he tapped, I thought, surely there's an injury here. Surely... Something happened with his collarbone. Maybe it's like a Dos Anjos Clay Guida situation. Something to do with his jaw. Because that arm triangle, Barbarina, he, he, first of all, he peppered him with elbows from the top before that. And Sage wasn't enjoying that at all. He looked like he, yeah, he, he I don't know. I don't want to say he was mentally giving up, but he looked like he was in a bad spot. Even against the cage, Barbarina was hitting him uh, with knees to the thighs, and he looked like he didn't like that. And then he gets to this arm triangle, but he didn't really get it. Like, it was. Mm. I mean, as far as arm triangles go, if there's like 100%, this was like at maybe 30. This is like at 25%. Like he needed a jump over. He was in half guard, which is one of the least advantageous positions. There's this half guard, there's side control, there's full mount. Side control probably being the best, half guard being one of the worst. I don't know if anyone's ever finished one from guard. So then you got half guard and then he was on the wrong side. So either Brian Barberina has an inhumane squeeze or... And again, we weren't in the cage, so it's kind of harsh for us to judge. But I just don't think that a lot of other fighters would have tapped to that. And I, I, I get that he's 19, but, you know, when you're at this level and you're in the UFC, it's kind of shocking to see a guy, you know, tap to, to an arm triangle like that. Yeah, no, nah, it was it was crazy. And one of the things about the fight, I mean, even before the arm triangle, Sage came out and he was very energetic at the beginning of the fight. But in between the first and second round, you could see... He was noticeably taking very deep breaths in the corner mm. and it seemed like he was getting tired. And also would, in the second round, you just didn't see that same movement. He was in the pocket a lot. He was getting hit quite a bit eventually. And he 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 sort of showed his inexperience. He showed he was a 19-year-old with not that many fights and quite a bit of an experience. And you saw, saw some holes in his game. And obviously, like you mentioned, on his back, he looked pretty helpless against Brian. But, I mean, the thing about this fight is there's been a lot of people on Twitter complaining because a lot of people have been happy that Sage lost, a lot of people have given him grief. But I have to say this, I have to say that in situations like um, Paige Van Zandt and Sage Northcote, when this UFC, like you mentioned, don't shove him down your throat, but sort of show fans that, hey, these are going to be the next big things. And they give him all this attention, and that obviously comes money, but also a lot of criticism. When someone like that loses, I don't think it's a big surprise that a lot of the fans are, you know, and I, this is going to sound mean, but sort of celebrating the fact that he lost. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of hardcore MMA fans out there that, you know, f felt like it was unfair that Sage got all that attention. Um, we spoke, you know, many times on the show about the fact that, and I believe, who brought that up? The point, oh, Demetrius Johnson uh, spoke about the fact, you know, Aljamain Sterling and those guys don't, for example, doesn't get paid as much as Sage does. And that's for a certain reason. But, you know, obviously Aljamain Sterling has more credentials and thus, you know, in a lot of ways should be getting paid more. So and I think a lot of the hardcore fans felt that it was unfair that Sage was getting all that attention, even though, you know, he was bringing eyes to the product and ratings to the to the TV viewership. And in that, in that regard, you know, it completely makes sense to me why you have so many people on Twitter sort of voicing their opinion about being happy that Sage lost. I mean, you got to let the fans have their reactions. A lot of people just made a really big deal out of it and they just need to sort of chill out and look at the whole situation. Yeah, I mean, look, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but I think the biggest thing to remember is none of this at all is Sage's fault. It's absolutely, it's not Sage's fault at all. If you're going to fault anyone, you would fault the UFC in the promotion. I mean, in, put... Anyone put yourself in Sage Northcutt's shoes. If you're, you know, sort of head and shoulders above these other guys in terms of promotional value, you know, you've got... And it's like if you go into a job, there's all these old timers and they've been working at a factory or wherever for years and years and years. And then you come in and you're young and they say, hey, we're going to make you the manager or whatever. There's going to be a lot of people who will be shitty. But what are you going to say? No. 
well, you want that extra money, you want, you know, w- whatever it is that you're looking for this job, and of course Sage is going to take it. So it's not Sage's fault at all. I And I don't actually have an issue with this, the UFC trying to promote him and trying to create a new star, because a lot of people, it's funny, a lot of people also complain, and I don't know if it's complaint, but they point out that, oh, you know, uh, you know, the UFC is going downhill and they're not getting the same ratings and the pay-per-views are down and, and this and that because, you know, Anderson Silva's gone and GSP is gone and all these draws are gone. So the UFC have to make new stars. And when we had Jim Ross on the show, uh, good old Jim Ross from the WWE who was, uh, had a huge role backstage in, mm. in dealing with talent and trying to harness these new stars that people may not have known much about, um, he was saying how the UFC does a very good job, but it would be good if they promoted their younger stars, the more up-and-comers, instead of making the mistake that a lot of not only mixed martial arts promotions and pro wrestling promotions, because whether you like to admit it or not, they have very similar business models. They focus on their old aging stars, and once those stars go, it's like they have n- no one there. So it's good that the UFC is promoting, you know, not only Ronda Rousey, not only Conor McGregor, but these young stars, and, you know, hoping that Paige Van Zandt and, you know, all these other people are going to make it big. So I don't have an issue with the UFC promoting Sage Northcutt, but I do agree that it's not fair in the least that he's getting paid so much more, like you mentioned, and Al Jermaine Sterling is seemingly getting scraps even though they're both you know doing the same job and you could definitely make the argument that Aljamain Sterling is doing a far far better job you know in in essentially the same role yeah no certainly and I mean it's one of those things where you know he doesn't have a choice what he's gonna what's gonna happen to him the UFC puts him in this position but with all that money and attention and being pushed up the ladder I mean you do get the criticism when you lose but I'm sure he'll Mm. take it on the chin I don't think it'll affect him too much but the other thing the other side of the coin is a lot of people saying that Sage is mentally weak. And to that I say, come on, guys, that's a bit ridiculous. The guy is 19 years old. He's a teenager. What do people expect? I mean, just because he folded in this fight and obviously, you know, Paige Van Zandt maybe withstood, withstood the brutal, you know, domination from Rose, you know, it doesn't mean that he's mentally weak. He's just 19 years old. With inexperience, you end up in situations like this. I wouldn't write off this fight you know, as a sign that he's mentally weak by any means. And I think people are sort of jumping the gun in that regard as well. Yeah, I think it's a tough one. I mean, tapping into an arm triangle like that, I don't know, man. I think there's a lot of people that are are doing just BJJ. And I guess BJJ is different to MMA. Obviously, you're not getting punched in the face and, and lit up. But I don't know. I, I don't know how many other people would have tapped to that, you know, whether you're 19 or not. I mean, Josh Barnett was something ridiculously young when he won the title. Um, you know, Vitor Belfort, again, people had the same complaints about Vitor Belfort folding under the pr- under pressure as well. But I don't know, man. Look, uh, you- I mean, with men- I mean, mental weakness, though, I don't think so. I think, it- look, to me personally, and this is just from sort of experience and grappling and stuff. I know that when, I- when I'm putting put in positions that I haven't had much experience in, you do seem to freak out. Or, you know, you, you seem to act a bit different than you would if you had some experience in those positions. And I definitely think what happened to Sage today was just, you know, because the guy has is just inexperienced. He just hasn't been on the big stage dominated, you know, by a guy like Brian in a, in a crappy position that he's not used to. And I think, I think, I really think that that's what got to him. I think if he had a bit more experience, and again, different age, um, it doesn't really, you know, describe people's mental toughness. There are a lot of people that are a lot younger who are mentally tough, a lot of people who are a bit older mentally tough, but I think it does come down to experience. And just looking at his record and the stuff that he's been through, he just hasn't really been through adversity before. And I don't know, just on the big stage, I think it must have just gotten to him. That's that's the sort of explanation that goes through my mind. But I just don't think it means that he's mentally weak. I just really think it means that he's inexperienced and just inexperienced in a position like that. I think I think inexperience definitely plays a big part of it, but I also think you can you can say that someone is mentally weak, and I don't think it's really fair for me to say he's mentally weak because I would probably say that Sage Northcutt is a lot more mentally strong than than myself. I'm not going to speak for you, Dennis, but like mm. he's he's more strong. He's more no, he's stronger strong. than me as well. Yes, he's strong. there. You go, <laughs> physically and mentally. So I don't yes, want to see. Thought I was like, nah, I'm strong. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm good, man. Maybe maybe if it's a uh, food eating competition, maybe then he's in uh, trouble. Then then where the the two mentally strongest bastards you'll ever meet but (laughs) i think you can still say someone is mentally weak but i think like mental strength is like physical strength so it's like you can be 16 and a string bean and and weak but then you become you know 20 or whatever and you're a power lifter and you're massive 
So I think same with mental weakness. You can say that someone is mental weak because, you know, they're they're 19, but they're still mentally weak, if that makes sense. So I think I think it's kind of a bit of both. I think it's the I, th- I think there are other fighters maybe that would have had a tougher upbringing in the Sage Northcutt. I don't want to chalk everything up to his upbringing, but I, I do believe he's had a pretty good one. I think. Yeah, I don't Katie- think it has anything to do with upbringing. I mean, you mean like fight experience stuff that's happened to him in his fights? Well, it's like some some fighters they're they're naturally mm. talented, and some fighters are naturally tough. Like if you've had a tough, I don't know. Like you look at Mark Hunt, and I think a lot of that is genetic as well. But Mark mm. Hunt's so tough because of the way he he you know his upbringing was. He's faced such crazy adversity on the streets and in his home and from his dad that you know he's he's a little bit desensitized to it and i would say that makes him mentally strong with with sage northcutt and i'm not going to talk about his personal life or anything like that but in that sense you might say that oh he, he might be mentally weak because whereas some guys would just grit it out and say i don't care how much it hurts or i don't care what i'm going through i'm going to go to sleep or i'm going to get you know my stuff broken it kind of seemed like sage tapped before he was really in true adversity. And I mean, th- these are UFC level fighters. Brian Barberina is, you know, he would he would fold us like toothpicks. So I don't want to say he wasn't in adversity, <laughs> but just the fact that the choke wasn't, it seemed to me like it wasn't locked in properly and he tapped a bit prematurely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, and it could be a situation where he just hasn't, doesn't know how to get out of that situation. I mean, a lot of people think it's crazy. This guy is in the UFC, but let's not forget, he was rushed into the UFC in a position that you know, now we know he's not ready for. You know, you're in a position where you don't know how to get out of a really simple choke like an arm triangle choke and you, you, you start freaking out. So who knows what it is, but I'm very interested to see what's going to happen in the future with for Sage and also any sort of interviews that come out as well. I mean, he's very PR savvy, but I wonder if that's right. going to go out the window now that he sort of had his first loss. He'll have a rap career now. <laughs> yeah, he's right. going he's gonna to go. He's going to go off the rails. Um yeah, I, and, I, and I think this is where age comes into a factor. He is 19, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but because he's 19, he has so much more room to grow. I mean, he could be he could be in the UFC for the next 10 years, which is a pretty hefty career, and he'd still only be 29, which is considered fairly young in this sport. Yeah, I mean, you don't yeah. hit your, your prime till you're like, you know, some guys don't hit their prime till they're like in their early 30s. So, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. And the, look, the other thing is, and this is again with the training, what, what's he going to keep doing? Because he trains with his dad and he went over tr- to TriStar and then they left because they didn't feel like the training was sort of the same as the training that they were used to. Mm. I think there was something like that. They left TriStar because they sort of weren't happy with the pacing and stuff like that. But he needs to be put into really difficult positions and his strength is definitely his striking, but with his grappling, He's going to have to get put into positions with tough guys who are really giving him a hard time. So I wonder if um, him and his dad will consider taking him back to TriStar or some other camps to sort of really get in there with some of those tough guys and, you know, give him a different perspective and training that he's used to. Well, you saw Farah Sahabi in his corner. So I don't know to what degree he was training with TriStar for this camp. I don't know whether he, he you know, went and did a bit more time there or Farah sort of came down and, mm. and it was like, look, I know you're not, you know, you haven't been training with us, but I'm going to corner you. And I think, you know, Farah is definitely a guy that you want in your corner, much like Greg Jackson or, or Coach Winkle, John. And I believe the reason his dad gave for not wanting Sage to train at TriStar or really any other gym was his energy levels. His dad wanted to monitor them. And he says that he knows when his son gets tired and he feels like other athletes are pushing themselves too hard. So he thought that if he went to TriStar, he may just, you know, ruin himself physically and and run himself dry. And he didn't want that to happen. I don't, I don't know. I don't... Listen, people laugh when, you know, Conor McGregor brought in a movement coach and a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of things throughout the years that people have laughed at and who knows, maybe his dad's onto something. I don't know. I believe his dad was a bodybuilder back in the day. Mm, And they Um, have similar hairstyles. They look exactly the same. <laughs> f- f- the jaw, the face. Yeah. His dad's still shredded. They look. They look identical. But maybe it's time for um, the father and son combination to go into a an area where he does lose a bit of energy and goes through a bit of a tough time just to get used to it. I suppose. Well, the other thing is, and you, you talked about experience and not being put in certain positions. Mm. Um, the other thing is that apparently Sage does doesn't spar. Right, they they mm. don't believe in, and I don't know whether that changed in Tristar. I mean, you and me talked about that conspiracy theory that what if it was him that knocked out Joe Duffy and you know kind of ruined that event a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether he sparred at Tristar, but I mean, and again, there's that sort of there's that argument of like, do you you know how, how much sparring is enough? But one thing that sparring will do, other than you know. 
potentially take years off your life if you do it wrong, it does give you that experience and it does put you in certain positions. And obviously, the, the position that Sage got in, that was, you know, that was on the ground. It's, it, it isn't really anything to do with sparring. You could just roll. You could practice your jiu-jitsu or you can do, you know, light sparring on, on the ground and improve in those areas. But either way, I don't think we've seen the ceiling of, of Sage Northcutt yet. He is 19. It's not in any way any, as an excuse, but I think the best, well... Who knows? I, I don't want to say the best of Sage Northcutt is yet to come. Who knows? But I, th- I think there's, you know, he's got a lot more years left in the sport, at least, if not the promotion. Yeah, agreed. Very sort of interested to see what happens with the young kid next. Hopefully, he doesn't just get tossed to the wayside now that he's had his first loss. Oh, I think with with what the UFC have invested in him, I think they're going to cling on to him. And, and like I said, it wouldn't surprise me to say, oh, you know. And here's the thing. He's taken, what, three fights in four months, something like that. And this one is at welterweight. Mm. So there's a lot of, from a marketing perspective, there's a lot of excuses you could give. I think, if anything, he'll probably take a bit of a break. And that's that's crazy how his dad's talking about you know, him getting tired and yet he's fighting so often. And yet he, he asked for this fight. He wanted it before he turned 20. So... I don't, I don't know exactly how that works, but I wouldn't be surprised if he takes a long, not a long break, but at least three, four, five months before he returns. Yeah, no, certainly. Very interested with that. Now, Cass, what's the next fight that we're breaking down on this pretty pretty exciting card? Well, Jim, it's funny you say exciting. Jimmy Rivera uh, defeated Yuri Alcantara. Mm-hmm. Uh, wasn't the most exciting fight, but Jimmy Rivera is proven to be a pretty decent prospect at bantamweight. Uh, mm-hmm. What was your take on this one, Dennis? Yeah, I was very, very impressed with Rivera in the first round. He controlled the center of the octagon and threw some bombs, got a big takedown at the end of round one. In the second round, Rivera tagged Yuri some more, landed some nice shots against the fence. Uh, Yuri actually caught him with a nice shot during an exchange near the end of the second round, which dropped him. But then Rivera slammed Yuri down. So that's two rounds, one. And then in the third round, more domination from Jimmy. Good exchange near the end of the round, a nice kick. But Yuri caught him and dropped him for a second time yuri tries to wrestle uh sorry rivera tried to wrestle yuri down and landed some nice shots at at the end of the at the end of the day jimmy just put on a very very good display now for people who don't know who he is he has fought across across bellator and world series of fighting before the ufc he is now on an 18 fight win streak cast which is pretty crazy he's only Mm. had one loss which came in his second fight in 2008 by a split decision um and one, he's actually, this is his third win in the UFC. One of his other two wins came over Marcus Brimage. So the guy's been around, but I think, yeah, a lot of spotlight on him in this card. Well, he said that he wants either Brian Caraway or Aljamain Sterling next. Mm. Um, you know, it, normally when you're not ranked, Uriel Cantara was ranked 14th. I mean, you would assume that Jimmy's at least going to be 14 now. Eddie Wineland, I don't know whether that guy's retired or not, but he's ranked 13. And so from there down, a lot of the guys are sort of, you know, oh, actually I wouldn't say book. No, there's a lot of free guys, but it seems like the the top guys are sort of, you know, already already booked in fights. I could, I don't know, I could potentially see him facing Mizugaki or Frankie Science next. But when you talk about an 18 fight win streak, I don't know. He he, he does have a bit of an argument for Brian Caraway or Aljamain Sterling. Yeah, I mean, it would be a very exciting fight. And it was cool to see the crowd get behind him. Obviously, he's a native of the uh, Jersey Shore yeah. area, the New Jersey area. And yeah, overall, it was it was quite an interesting fight. But that Frankie Science fight that you mentioned, <laughs> that would be a tough fight. Science is yeah. a very, very tough competitor. So it would be great to see what Jimmy has to offer against a guy with as much experience as Frankie has. Let's move on. Ben Rothel versus Josh Barnett. Um <laughs> One of the biggest surprises of the night, obviously, Ben Rothor getting the submission over Josh Barnett. I don't know if you want to mention anything about your thoughts before the fight, but if not, what did you think and what did you think of Ben Rothor getting the submission over Josh? I have to say, before the fight, I was supremely disappointed when I saw Ben Rothor came out without his cape. The mm. music was playing, he was doing the looks, but you have to wear the cape. And of course, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it, but now it sort of makes sense. Do you think it's because of the Reebok kit? They're like, you can't cover up your Reebok kit during your entrance. Mine, I think Reebok make capes. So I think, I think that's why. But they need to make capes. They I need mean, to make, clearly, they need to make capes. I just right? feel like, and this is, it sounds really stupid, but I actually feel like, you know, Reebok's in a, posi- a difficult position where fans don't feel like they really customize their wear for the fighters. And a lot mm. of the fighters wear the same thing. I think if Reebok came out with a custom cape mm. for Ben Rothwell, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but you start winning some fans onto your side. You know, a Ben Rothwell cape would probably sell better than all the fight kits put together. 
I'd Can you buy, imagine that? I'd buy a Ben Rothel cape, cape just because it's a cape and it's a Ben Rothel cape before I bought any of the fight kits. So, And, you know, here in Australia, we've got some good cape weather as well. You know, nice and sunny, <laughs> bit of a wind, so it can blow in the wind. Mm-hmm. And it, Especially I mean, if you're Frank Costanza's lawyer, you know? Yeah, you I saw where I was going cape, with that. Yeah. Yeah. But what if people are like, oh, is that, a, is that Dennis in a cape? And then they're like, yeah, you're right, let's cross the road. <laughs> <laughs> before I'll tell you what. So I was very disappointed with that aspect, but yeah, still happy to hear him have his music, make his faces. Um, before the fight, obviously, for people who didn't watch, uh, Josh Barnett actually had a small pro wrestling match in his open workout with a masked man came in. Mm. And, and, you know, Josh actually took a few bumps on that hard boxing ring, which I was like, whoa, you know, heavyweight, 38 years old, fighting yeah. a couple of days. I was like, wow. And, you know, not really a regular pro wrestler. Josh has had some pro wrestling fights and he actually uh, coaches pro wrestling himself sometimes. But yeah, I thought, whoa, a bit risky. But, mm. you know, the fight, Ben Rothwell submitting Josh Barnett, it was, I was absolutely shocked. I was so shocked. I mean, before that happened, Josh's corner told him, you know, he's afraid to go in the clinch with you. And Josh goes, yeah, I know. And then they get in that position. I mean, that go-go choke. I think a lot of people think they can be put in that go-go choke and get out of it. But once you put in it, I don't think there's a way out. I think a guy as strong as Ben Rothwell, if he's squeezing that choke, I think a lot of people feel confident because they're very skilled on the ground. They can get Mm. out of it. But this isn't a a guillotine. I think it's a lot worse. So I feel like Josh Barnett wasn't worried about Ben Rothwell's go-go choke and got caught, which is a shame because... Earlier in the fight, I was actually really impressed with Barnett's boxing. He was using a nice jab, mm-hmm. had a nice left, um, was moving around quite well, and he was actually winning the fight in my book. So, yeah, that, that was crazy. What about you, Cass? What did you make of the whole thing? Yeah, absolutely crazy. I mean, Josh Barnett, he, he employs more catch wrestling than Brazilian mm. Jiu-Jitsu, which is a lot more, I guess, aggressive style. They, they always say that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is positioned first, then go for submissions. Catch wrestling is kind of the opposite. Go for a submission, then, you know, worry about the position later. It's, it's really, you know, catch whatever you can get. Um, just, um, you know, I'm looking at Josh Barnett's submission grappling record. He beat Travis Fulton back in 99. He lost to Mark Kerr. He beat Pedro Duarte. He lost to Garth Taylor, Mark Kerr, and Ricardo Almeida all in a row. This is all in 99 and 2000, right? In 2014, and this is what Joe Rogan was talking about, he beat Dean Lister with a scarf hold choke, right? And that was pretty crazy. That was at Meta Morris, uh, I think, four and Dean Lister hadn't been submitted in 10 years. And I don't know whether he was the favorite. I mean, I watched that Meta Morris. I didn't focus too much about who was the favorite or not. But that was a huge accomplishment. Then mm. you got Heron Gracie, right? Who everybody knows from, you know, him and his brother do Gracie Breakdown. Like Gracie Academy and all that kind of stuff. And Josh submitted him with a toehold. And that was a Metamora 6. The one that was like really, really, really under the radar. I think they didn't even have a you know a crowd or an audience for that one. But so going in with that, I mean, it's one thing to submit um, Matt Mitrione. But I keep thinking about the time that Mark Hunt almost armbarred Josh Barnett when they fought in Denver. And then I'm pretty sure Gabriel Gonzaga um, submitted him, I think, via uh, guillotine. So I thought that as far as grappling and wrestling, Josh Barnett would have the advantage. And I thought, look, Ben Rothel can knock anybody out. But I definitely saw Josh Barnett, with the way he controls people in the octagon and against the cage and on the ground, I thought that Josh Barnett would find a way to control Ben Rothel, get him down to the ground. And uh, I'm not saying he'd you know, submit him with an arm triangle as easily as, say, uh, Brett Rogers and... Um, uh, it was the Russian guy in Strike Force, Sergey um, Karatanov. Yeah. yeah, but I, I, I like if anyone is going to get finished, I would see either Rothel by knockout or Josh Barnett via submission. As mm. far as submissions, I would never ever predict Ben Rothel to submit Josh Barnett. So mm. it's it's an absolute massive massive feat, and you know he he had a great promo afterwards. He basically called out. Not necessarily for a fight, but just on their accomplishments. He called out Stipe. He called out Overeem. He called out pretty much everybody under the sun who is now in the title picture. I think Vadum, And he basically said that he's coming for everyone. So a massive, massive win for Ben Rothwell. And then a great promo to cut it off. Uh, sorry, cap it off. No cape. Although I think it's technically mm-hmm. a robe body war. No robe or cape or anything. But um, I mean, it couldn't have it couldn't have been a better night. Like that, a win like that really separates you from the pack. Yeah, no, certainly. And you brought up some great points with Ben Rothwell having issues with against Mark Hunt and other guys. I mean, and it really sort of brings me to this other discussion where, you know, pure grappling, 
is such a different game to MMA. And mm -hmm. I almost feel like if it was Josh Barnett versus Ben Rothwell in a Meta Morris, you know, Barnett would dominate him. Mm. But when, it, when you bring it into MMA and you've got those gloves and you can punch and you can kick and you've got that fence, I feel like it's a different game. And I, I don't think people are really taking it into account as much. We do have a lot of really great, for example, Olympic wrestlers or high caliber submission, pure submission artists that do go into MMA and they just don't find the same level of success. But no, I was very, very impressed with Ben Rothwell. I mean, what, what, what do you want to see him do next, Cass? Because now it looks like Fabrizio of Doom will be fighting um, Stipe. We're still not sure what's going to happen, but over Twitter, apparently apparently Vadum wants to fight him. I don't think it makes sense for Kane to fight Vadum now that he's uh, sort of gone out with injury. So mm. Kane's up there. You know, Kane's already fought Rothwell. Maybe that could be a rematch that could happen, but it depends how long he's out for. Then there's that over him rematch. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if people really... I don't, I don't know think, if the UFC want to make that rematch because if they do re-sign over him to that big contract, is it is it like... Is it, sort of a gamble to put him yeah. up against Rothwell? I don't know. It's a gamble. And, like, what does Rothwell have to gain from that? I know you mentioned yeah. Overeem, but I think you only mentioned him because he's, you know, Overeem's ranked number three, and people are talking about him potentially getting, you know, one of the guys, him being one of the guys who gets the next shot. It's crazy because Rothwell is seventh, and he beat him. Mm. Number six is Travis Brown. Here's what I'm thinking. If Kane doesn't get the next shot, you could do Overeem versus Kane, right? Um, just because they're both at the top, whoever wins that could potentially gets the next shot. I think with Rothwell, you either give him that Junior Dos Santos fight that he's been wanting for a long time. Mm. So one of two things, or, or Travis Brown. With Junior Dos Santos, one of two things happen. Either Ben Rothwell beats him because Dos Santos has really been looking like he's on the decline, or Dos Santos comes back, potentially gets a knockout, or you know outstrikes Ben Rothwell, and then boom, you got Dos Santos sort of back in the pack. And he can face, you know, maybe, you know, he can potentially face Verdum in a rematch, or even Stipe, or or, or even Overeem. But I guess, I guess the safe option, as I'm sort of saying this aloud, probably Travis Brown. They're both on wins. Travis Brown has a bit of steam behind him. I know he wants to have a great 2016. That could potentially come to a screeching halt against Ben Rothwell. You know, we saw we saw Travis Brown take down uh, Matt Mitrione and have his way with him. They've both beaten Mitrione. I think Ben Rothwell did it a lot quicker. So. I think that's the fight to make. I, I think, look, Ben is really close to the title, but if you look at their records, Stipe's beaten Andre Olovsky, Gonzaga, and Mark Hunt. Ben Rothwell has lost to Andre Olovsky, Gonzaga, and Mark Hunt. So I know the MMA math doesn't always work, and actually in most cases it doesn't work, but I think Stipe, he's got the right shot up there. If Ben Rothwell's going to get a title shot, the time is not, not quite yet. Not, not at rank number seven. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I mean... Who knows what's going to happen in Brisbane, Mark Hunt versus Frank Mir. If Mark Hunt does win that fight, it could set up a potential rematch between the two. But I would love to see him fight Junior Dos Santos and Travis Brown. I think those are good fights to make. And very interested to see what happens there. Because like we mentioned, um, before he got that go-go choke, you know, he was doing some things right. But he's And he's got such an unorthodox style. I mean, Jerrigan mm. mentioned it. He switches stances. And sometimes he just stands right in front of you and throws punches, but Josh Barnett was p starting to pick him, uh, pick him apart with some boxing. So, very interested to see how long he could get this, keep this thing going, but I will say I'm a huge fan of seeing Rothwell at work, and especially in his prime eyes. I'm, I'm just really happy there's another guy in the division we can look forward to watching. And the other thing about Rothwell, one thing I've noticed, uh, it's not really something as of late, but in general, over this last sort of win streak that he's on, he's had very ugly wins. Like against Brandon Vera, Vera was doing really well, and then Brent, and then you know Ben Rothwell initiated sexy dancing 101, and then ended up <laughs> knocking out Brandon Vera in what was kind of a hilarious finish for a number of reasons. You had Ben Rothwell doing doing the sexy robot dance, you had uh, Brandon Vera kind of doing this awkward back roll. But anyway, it was it was an ugly win. Then Alistair Overeem was getting in with some good shots until mm -hmm. Ben Rothwell knocked him out. Mitrione, we talked about this in the past. Mitrione was doing well against him. He he didn't look bad at all. It looked like he was hitting him with some shots. Ben was talking about how he's actually uh, avoiding most of them. But then mm -hmm. again, Mitrione went in for a takedown. Boom, he got that go-go choke. And again, Josh Barnett, same thing. You mentioned it. I agree. He had a good jab, Josh did. And he had some good moments in the fight until... Once again, he went for a takedown and got, you know, caught in that go-go choke. I think mm. people are going to be really looking out and being very careful to take down Ben Rothwell, you know, because they might get caught with that choke. Oh, for sure. It's going to be a choke. That I think it, whatever opponent it's going to be is going to break down before it happens. And 
it's one of those situations where if Rothwell went to a conventional training camp <clears throat> and had sort of standard coaches and followed the game, maybe he wouldn't be as good. But I do really think that he believes in his style. He believes in some of these things that he's created, some of these unorthodox movements that he makes in the ring. And I actually think that's what actually makes him so dangerous. You just don't know what to expect from him. So very interested interested to see what happens with him next. And yeah, whoever he fights next, whether it be Travis Brown, Junior Dos Santos, no doubt about it, they'll be reviewing the go-go choke and trying to get out of it. Because if they don't, you'd have to be stupid by this point. There is no way you could go on the ground with a guy without making sure that you know how to get out of that go-go choke. If there is, if even is a way to get out of it once you get your hands in the right position. But the thing that makes him so dangerous is not only his belief in his unorthodox style, but also mm. the fact that he can take so much damage. And also, he is a super strong guy. So when he does put that go-go choke on, it probably feels like your head's been crushed you know, by a monster truck. So... It's it's crazy thing. He's he's got a very interesting combination of um, unorthodox skill, uh, belief, and also strength. Mm. Let's talk about the main event: Anthony Rumble Johnson versus Ryan Bader. There's not really much to talk about here because <laughs> it lasted all of about three seconds. Yeah. What's there to say, man? <laughs> Ryan Ryan Bader. The the wheels finally fell off. I think a lot of people picked Ryan, uh, Anthony Rumble Johnson to win this fight. As as did I. Did you, Dennis? Were you also one of the people that thought Anthony Rumble Johnson would win? Yeah. I mean. I wanted to see Bader win because of everything that he's gone through. I wanted to see him mm. reach that title shot. But when they announced that Johnson fought, I was pretty much sure that it, he was not going to get there. But, um, yeah, I mean, this fight cast, I, I had one note that I wrote down in my computer as I was watching it. And it says, well, that's the end of that chapter. I mean, what can you say? <laughs> no one is going to sort of look back and uh, sort of not be happy at a Kimura attempt like Ryan Bader. He went for that Kimura and man, did it cost him the fight? Uh, Johnson advanced to mount and once he was in mount, I was already writing, well, that's the end of that chapter because yeah. I knew Ryan Bader was not going to be able to withstand strikes from mount from Anthony Johnson. I mean, that would be, those strikes would be double, maybe triple in power from that position and yeah, it, it was all over. I mean, what what can be said, Cass? Would were you surprised that Ryan Bader went for that Kimura? What did you think when you saw Johnson sort of get in that mount position? Did you think it was all over? Yeah, pretty much. As soon as he was getting up there for mount, I thought if Ryan Bader can somehow... Because you, you saw him sort of inching his way up there mm. and you just thought like, oh man, like this, is, this has got to be the end. You think if Ryan Bader can somehow get out of this, it's going to be an absolute miracle. And if that happens, we may be potentially watching an amazing fight that has a lot of backs back and forth. But it's not what happened. You know, Ryan Bader gave him his back. And those punches from Anthony Rumble Johnson, they didn't even seem that big. Like, I don't really know which one put out Ryan Bader. It was like, the ending reminded me of Shane Carwin versus Frank Mir. But with that fight, you had, like, clear punches, sledgehammer punches that you saw were hitting Frank Mir here. I don't know. Like, I, d I didn't really see the shot that put out Ryan Bader. And when Anthony Rumble Johnson got up and Ryan Bader was still out, I was like... Wow, really? Those punches? I don't know. It, it, there wasn't even that much windup. They look like nothing. So, yeah, Anthony Rumble Johnson just punched his ticket to take on, you know, either Daniel Cormier in a rematch or potentially John Jones. Um, I think the John Jones has the John Jones fight has a lot, a lot. I don't know if I'd say a lot more value, but we haven't seen that before. I mm. think that's a much easier sell, and I think people would be curious about that. Um, as far as the DC rematch, you know, there's a story. And I think the UFC were focusing on that as well. They showed him, uh, you know, training his grappling with Neil Melenson, who is an absolute phenom, has a lot of health ailments, but is an absolute phenom when it comes to grappling. He used to be based down there at Extreme Couture, and now he's there with the, with the Black Zillion. So the UFC were kind of promoting it as he's the new and improved Rumble Johnson. He's worked on his grappling, which was, you know, what sort of undid him against Cormier. So if... if if he really has improved that much, and you know he's obviously got probably months and months before he he potentially fights either John Jones or Daniel Cormier, depending on who wins, and you know if those guys come out injury free. But he's got a long time to improve his grappling, and if he can improve his grappling and also work on his cardio as well, then uh, you know it's very believable that he could potentially beat DC or John Jones. I would still pick them to win, but with yeah with Rumble Johnson, you just never know. Yeah, I mean it's interesting as well. What is Rashad Evans' uh, status with the Black Zillions? Is he still there or did he move on? Why do I feel like he moved on? I know, I believe he changed managers. I don't mm -hmm. think Glenn Robinson is his manager anymore. He may still be training at the Black Zillions. Okay, so it'll be interesting to monitor because if he does leave the Black Zillions, 
then that could be a great fight as well if he has a big, big win over Shogun and looks dominant. But yeah, um, I really think that the Jones fight has a lot more sizzle to it than the DC fight. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, the odds will tell you that Jones will probably beat DC and then go on to possibly fight Johnson. And Johnson would be a great next fight for Jones. But if DC does get through... Jones, I mean, it could be another situation like a, a Uriah Faber situation where Anthony Johnson stays up the top of the division but just can't manage to win the belt, which would be sort of interesting as well, I suppose. Well, that's pretty much what's happening with Ryan Bader here. I mean, mm. he he had the streak of his life, other than when he first debuted and, you know, he, he, he won his first 12 fights. He was on the streak of his life. He beat Anthony Parash, Javier Cavacante, you know, Fager, uh, OSP, Phil Davis, and then the best performance we've ever seen from him against Rashad Evans. But then he lost in the title eliminator against Anthony Rumble Johnson. It's, it's kind of the theme of his career. Like, yeah. he was looking really good when he he beat uh, Little Nog. And then against John Jones at UFC 126, we're talking years ago in 2011. I don't know if that was officially a title eliminator, but I think it was because they were both undefeated at the time, both big prospects. And obviously Jones went on to fight Shogun for the belt. You know, he lost a t- he he came back and lost to Tito Ortiz. He came back. He knocked out Jason Brills in one round, even less. Then he had a big win over Quentin Rampage Jackson in Japan, which a lot of people didn't think would happen. Then he ran into Machida, got knocked out. Came back against Vladimir Matushenko, knocked him out in less than a minute. Ran into Glover Teixeira, and then you know we come to today where he's on this five fight win streak. You know we've had Ryan on the show multiple times, and there were a lot of times where you felt like you know this guy does deserve the next title shot. In hindsight, I think everything worked out pretty well for you know the fans and entertainment wise. But man, my heart goes out to him because, like yeah. I said, it, it was the run of his career that started in 2013. So this is like a a two year run that's that's now completely snapped. And I don't know, he he's kind of <clears throat> stuck in that position of. I don't want to use the term gatekeeper, but it's just hard to... He, he's still at the top of the division, but it's just kind of hard to see him winning his, his way back to a title shot. After, yeah. after The UFC seemingly didn't want to give him one in the first place, and he was at this point where it was hard to argue if, it, if, if you know he won. And now that he's lost, it's like, well, there you go. No title shot for you. It's interesting, though, because he does have an opportunity to have a couple of good fights. And um, there's a fight with Alexander Gustafson that would make sense for him. And also, if DC loses to John Jones, the DC Ryan Bader fight could still make a bit of money because of their beef. Mm. So those are a couple of fights he could still have. But yeah, certainly when you look through the people that he's beaten, apart from sort of Rashad Evans and Phil Davis and OSP, a lot, some of the other guys probably not at the top of the division. Maybe even if we take OSP out of there, I mean, it, a lot of people sort of pointing to the fact that hey, he can't hang in there with a guy like Anthony Johnson or on Anthony Johnson's caliber, but. I'll be interested to see what's going to happen with Ryan Bader in the future. Who knows what's going to happen in this light heavyweight division. But yeah, certainly he could end up, like you mentioned, Cass, a gatekeeper. And how, who knows how many wins he'd have to get to get back in a position to get a title shot. I mean, it would have to be quite a few. So yeah, hard goes out to Bader. Who is a submission radio alumni? I feel like because he's gotten that many wins, he is penciled at the top of the division, at least for now. Unless he goes for a real big slide, I'm, you know, kind of like Jake Ellenberger, when mm. people were talking about him getting the next shot, and then he just completely fell off the rails. If he can sort of, if he if he can beat uh, some of the people that you mentioned before, like if he does somehow beat, say, Gustafsson or, or beats DC, then I think, you know, he may earn himself an actual title shot, or at least, you know, prove that he can stay up the top. But you know, if he, if he goes on to lose to both those guys and he's on three losses in a row, then it's almost like, you know, he, he's, he's kind of taking his exit from the top of the division. He might be, you know, stuck around that, you know, between eight and five in the rankings. I feel, I feel bad for the guy. I really, It's do. one of those situations as well, Cass. If you look at the light heavyweight top 10, not much new blood. A lot of the same old fighters. Mm. And you can sort of start getting worried a little bit. If John Jones does beat DC... How many fresh matchups will he really have from the top 10? Because most of these guys are guys that he's fought or, you know, guys have lost pretty big fights. So it, not, much, not much options for him if, if he does beat DC and Anthony Johnson. Well, I think in a way there's there's a solution. There's also another problem that comes from that solution because John Jones eventually the you know the mm. word on the street is that he's going to go up to heavyweight anyway. So I don't think that's really so much his problem. They'll they'll do the DC fight, 
They'll probably do, you know, Anthony Rumble Johnson fight. fight. Yeah. This is assuming that, you know, he is still champion. And then maybe they can do the Alexander Gustafsson fight. Maybe, depending on how, you know, Gustafsson does. I mean, that's like what? That's almost a year and a half's worth of of fights. Potentially, maybe, depending on, you know, layoffs and injuries. I mean, if... If he fights DC and that's around April, right? We're already halfway through the year. And then if you if you go towards the end of the year and then you do Rumble Johnson, let's say he beats him, he may not be fighting Gustafsson until 2017, early 2017, depending on how the turnarounds work. And then if he goes to heavyweight, you know, that could be like mid to late 2017. So there's there's a bit of juice to squeeze and in that time we may see new new guys come up in the light heavyweight division, but where it gets tricky is if he does leave light heavyweight and go to heavyweight. How is he going to, you know, if, if the division is without a champion, then you might, you know, you might be screwed. But then yeah. DC might be champion. Or they may, you know, with Conor McGregor potentially holding two belts, he's got the argument to say, no, I'm not I'm not losing my light heavyweight title. I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to defend both belts. If, or you know, Conor if, McGregor if can move up to light heavyweight and fight uh, everybody. No it's doubt. Next no doubt he will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just jump over middleweight from welterweight and just get into light heavyweight. What's the problem? The next press conference. Yeah. In, in like a year or two time, he'll hold like 60 belts. I have a feeling the light, I can make light heavyweight and hold that belt. So I want to see Conor McGregor fight Roy Nelson. Roy Why Nelson? can't he fight Roy Nelson? Of he course. fought the boulder from... Game of Thrones, why can't he fight Ron Nelson? <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because I was reading an interview with uh, the the what's, the Mountain and uh, he was saying that none of what Conor McGregor hit him with hurt at all. Whereas well, Conor it McGregor, sounds like the Mountain to say something like that. I'll tell classic you Classic Mountain. Ma- classic Mountain. <laughs> mountain needs to go back to Jersey Shore because Mountain is a great name for one of uh, Situation's friends. Yeah, yo, the mountain. <laughs> yeah, mountain's like Icelandic or something. Yeah, like you mentioned from Game of Thrones. And uh, but now apparently Conor McGregor was like, you know, I put him down with my body shots, and the mountain was like, look, he had a fight coming up. I didn't want to rip his head off. So mm. boys will be boys. Mountain spitting fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's pretty much it. That's that's it for another show. I think we've been uh, we've been yakking for a while. So thank you very much uh, for listening to us. Thank you so much for our guests, obviously, Dr. Anne-Maria DeMars, Ronda Rousey's mum, but a woman in her own right. We had uh, the the wonderful Tim Kennedy mm-hmm. and his fantastic sound effects before and after every question, <laughs> which were very much appreciated. And then uh, we, the Don Fry. How could you forget Don Fry? Classic Don Fry. So all three Submission Radio alumni, and obviously thanks to you for listening to the show. Dennis, any, any last final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, well, it's going to be a couple of movie reviews before yeah. we let the listeners go. Um, mm-hmm. Cassie, you watch The Hateful Eight, which I haven't had a chance to check out, and you're going to be breaking that down. But before you do, I'm just going to quickly let people know my thoughts about a movie called Spotlight, which uh, has Mark Ruffalo in it. It basically talks about the controversy surrounding the very serious issue of um, pedophilia in, in churches, priests uh, molesting young boys, and also the story that the Boston Globe re- released that actually brought a lot of light to the situation and won a Pulitzer Prize. It has Michael wow. Keaton in it as well. And it's, it's one of those movies that I would really suggest everybody watches because it's very a lot, it's obviously based on true story. The stories that are in this movie actually came out in the newspaper and a lot of these facts were true. Obviously, there, are, there is some fiction around relationships between characters, but it didn't really affect the outcome of the story. And I really think this is a movie that everybody needs to watch, whether you're religious or not. It tells a, a really, really sad story of a really big cover-up that – Heard a lot of families around the world. And at the end of the movie, they uh, put down the statistics of people affected. Um, and it wasn't just America. It was actually all over the world, which included Adelaide here in Australia. Um, it also included Auckland in New Zealand. Wow. So uh, no doubt about it, possibly some of our listeners also affected by this huge tragedy that really should have never happened. A huge cover up that, you know, is just despicable to see. And I really think everybody needs to watch this movie and, um, you know, come up with your own thoughts on how it all happened and on the church and what they did. But, you know, you, you really need to watch this one. But obviously the, with Mark Ruffalo in this movie, the uh, acting was stellar. I give this four, four mustaches out of five, four Timothy John, Johnson mustaches out of five. It's not going to be easy to watch. It's not going to be a movie that you're going to watch again after watching it once. But I think it's something that people need to check out, Cass. It's one of those things that it's a story that people need to know. And um, I was very, very happy that I watched it. Wow. Very great review. And contrasting to that, not so much contrasting, but I kind of felt similar in after The Revenant, like not at all in terms of themes, but just in the Mm. sense that it's probably not a movie I'm going to see 
maybe never again because it's a very long movie, but it's definitely worth seeing at least once. I'll tell you about Hateful Eight real quick. Um, I watched it the other night, went and saw it with the girlfriend. Mm. Um, multiple times, I think she may or may not have fallen asleep. <laughs> I would normally be, well, I wouldn't say frustrated with my girlfriend. As long as she doesn't bother me during the movie, then I don't care if she falls asleep. But in, in this sense, I was a little bit understanding. So this is obviously the eighth film by Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino movies are known for powerful, if not sometimes long dialogue, and a very, very good character building. And usually, you know, Tarantino movies are pretty long. I mean, take a look at, say, Kill Bill that spanned over two two actual movies to cover everything. And mm. it's always building to something. It's almost like Zorba's dance. It kind of gets faster as it picks up. <laughs> yeah. And then there's this sort of something at the end that caps it off. Um, I mean, let's look at just a few of his movies. Reservoir Dogs, fantastic. Pulp Fiction mm-hmm. was great. Jackie Brown was great. Kill Bill was amazing. You know, he did a bit of Sin City. That was fantastic. Inglorious Bastards is one of my favorite movies. And Django was very, very good in his own right. So naturally, I expected Hateful Eight to be up there as well. I knew pretty much nothing about it going to the movie. I saw a trailer during a UFC event, and that's pretty much it. I got to be honest with you, I was, I was disappointed with this one. Oh, wow. It was really, really, really long. I Mm -hmm. think, I could be wrong, but I think, and I'm not sure whether I'm confusing this or The Revenant, but I think it was about two hours and 47 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's long. When a movie is almost three hours, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, Actually, no, I'm on IMDb right now, three hours and seven minutes. Wow. You're going to feel every minute of it. It is, it does feel very long. And there's, I'm the type of person, when I, when I watch a movie, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. If you look at me, I'll be pissed off. I can't be needed. <laughs> like, I am that focused mm-hmm. on everything. Every, every Everything means something in a movie, and I want to sort of, like, capture it all. But in this movie, I really felt like my mind was wandering. I was looking around the cinema. I was like, what's that guy eating? Um, just because it really is that long a movie. It, it is very slow-paced as well. Um, you do get that hyper-violence, that extreme violence. There's some... Bit don't take kids to this movie if you if you're gonna go in there, um, be prepared. There's a lot of blood at certain moments. Um, there's that classic Tarantino feel to it. But yeah, I don't know. There, there's a lot of character building. I think like the first hour or two hours is basically all character building, and I just feel like it kind of caps off at the end. And you're like, eh, really? That's it? Like after all that? Like that's the way it ends? I really felt the ending to be. I don't know, unsatisfactory. I almost feel like it kind of went nowhere. It was like it was like a massive roller coaster, and it's just climbing, climbing, climbing. I mean, you're up in the clouds. You can't even see the ground anymore, and you're like, man, this is this is going to be something crazy. And then you get to the top, and the roller coaster kind of goes down like a couple of meters, and it turns yeah. out you're on like the sky level. And then you, you just get off, and you're like walking around. There's like a little mall and, and hot dog stand in the sky, and you're like, really? I thought we were going to drop all the way back down to the ground. So if it was a roller coaster, it'd be a little bit disappointing. So hey, for late, I don't know, man. Check it out if you want. If you've got three hours to kill, if you've got better plans on like a Friday, Saturday night, I'd go with those plans. <laughs> um, but if it's like a Tuesday, a quiet Tuesday and you have to, then go see Hateful Eight. So, I'm giving it... Um, and, and one more thing that I want to say, you know, the, the powerful dialogue, sometimes in Tarantino movies, actually usually in Tarantino movies, that powerful dialogue is almost iconic. You can you can quote it, and you just, you're like, ah, oh, man, that, that character said whatever, whatever the character... I, I don't know, I'm, I'm lost for quotes right now, but you kind of remember those quotes. Like in, uh, like in what's it called, that movie... Ah, uh, that was the quote, um... Help me here, Dennis. Uh... Waiting? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's bad no, movie. not waiting. If, if anybody's played that game before, you know what we're talking about. The yeah, the the, the Dick game. No, the one where he was a guest director, Tarantino. It was with um, Christopher Walken. Ah, yeah, yeah, Remember? yeah. Seven Psychopaths? N- no. <laughs> true Romance. I think it was True Romance. Oh, yeah, true Romance. Yeah, that was and great. Then, and then Walken goes in, I think he's in the trailer, and he's like delivering that powerful speech, and he's like, you and that dirty, dirty little whore. And you're just like, <laughs> oh, man, who writes this? And then and then there's uh, the, the other scene in Pulp Fiction. Uh, yeah, Pulp Fiction, where mm-hmm. Christopher Walken's in it. And he's like talking about the watch, and he's like, "He carried that watch in his ass, and now I'll give the watch to you, little man." And you're like, "Oh man, who writes this shit?" And in Hateful Eight, you just don't really get anything that memorable. You're like, "Eh, okay, cool." They talk for three hours, and then it ended. So, I'm gonna give it two Timothy Johnson mustaches. Ooh. I think that's my lowest ever. 
Scorching, scorching. See, I'm not the only bitch here. You know, as people get <laughs> people get on me about my scores, but you know, we ain't always bitching. But there you go, too. And that's crazy because uh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it 75. percent But I'll be honest, you're not the first person to actually say it's around that score. So mm. I'll have to check it out as well. And maybe I'll give a, a review too. But anyway, guys, that is the whole episode. We'll be back next week to review UFC Fight Night 82, formerly known as UFC 196, with a bunch of guests. Thanks for tuning in and have a great week. 